on this episode of Skeptico. A show about going away. There you are. We were wondering when you'd show up. And a show about when to come back. We can't make everyone aware. We, we just, we just, the default is everybody's sleeping. And now I'm going to try to wake up as much as I can. And if I meet others on my journey who also seek that or has some ability to do that or has shown to do that to some extent, I'm going to hitch my wagon to that person as long as that's useful for both of us. That first clip was from the wonderful Christmas movie Shutter Island. And the second was from today's guest, the one and only Al Borealis from Forum Borealis, who joined me, or I should say I joined him, to talk about 2022 year in review for both Skeptico and for Forum Borealis. Now, as some of you may have noticed, I have taken a step back from the mic on Skeptico. Haven't done episodes in a couple of months. So it was really great to get back in touch with Al and to talk about the year in review and the reasons why I stepped back and some of my thoughts on when and if I should continue and in what form I should do so. So I enjoyed the chat. It did bring up some stuff for me as I continue to work out and figure out where I want to go, a process which I would really, really appreciate you all joining me and telling me what direction you think this show should go in. It is my personal journey, but it's shared with you, so I'd like to know your thoughts on it. But before we can get to that, we have to listen to the year in review with my special guest, Al Borealis from Forum Borealis. And welcome to this swap casting, our annual review of the year with Skeptico and Forum Borealis. Hello, Alex. How are you? I'm great, Al. How are you? <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty stoked for this thing. It's um, it's a lost, it's, it, last time we had a show with each other. It was the end of the year, wasn't it? Well, actually, after the end of the year, you were, you know, so kind to do the anniversary show. Oh, that's right. On that's Skeptico. Right. So that yes. was quite a, quite an event on my uh, on my twenty two calendar. So uh, that was great. Yeah, that's how we uh, that's how we entered this year. Actually, great entrance. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you know, I have been, I have backed off of the mic lately. I have not done a show in a couple months, and that might be something we're going to talk about as well because I'm trying to find my way forward in in this Ooh. journey and in the way that I'm trying to do it. So uh, we've got a number of things to talk about. That is interesting. I, I, I've i done the complete opposite. I've never made as many shows as now. My listeners are even shocked that they got three shows this month. <laughs> so from being lagged far behind in the beginning of the year, and going through some very time-consuming personal issues we don't have to get into. Yeah, yeah. I've turned around the ship, and now I'm ahead. Great. And I've even started uh, catching up at YouTube. So so that's interesting that we took such a different turn there. But where do you want to start for today? Well, you know, the format we did last time, I thought, had legs, but then we could change it as well. Last year, we did three significant moments from Forum Borealis and interleave those with three significant moments for me from Skeptico. And then with, and I've already teed you up with this, some predictions, because I have gone back (laughs) and listened to those predictions you made from last year. And you have not. Warning, some serious (laughs) ball busting is coming. Warning. Yep, go on. (laughs) No, you got the gist of it. Yeah. So what did I say? I forgot. I completely forgot all all of it. I think we should. I think we should hold it off until we get to the predictions at the end. Okay. I, I did, and you know, we could we could start there. We could start anywhere you want because I have some interesting thoughts on the simulation theory as well. But uh, we could start there. Yeah, you wanted to talk with me on or about it, so let's start there. Well, why don't you then start by telling folks about 
your conversation with Riz Verk and how that went and, you know, what you pulled out of that for for folks who listen to Foreign Borealis. Sure. It's not that much to say, though. Um, I first heard Riz at your show and it was such a great show. And usually when I hear a great show, I think it's done. It's done there's no way for me to, there's no point for me to reiterate what was just done. But this was one of the rare exceptions where, despite that I heard a perfect show, and I'm talking, I think, about your first show with him, not the second. I was kind of disappointed with the second. Okay. But the first was the gold standard in my book for this topic. So I thought, hmm, can I contribute here? Can I expand on this? And I was thinking, yeah, maybe I can tie it more to the classical view, which I really what I, I adhere to. But the lines between them are fairly thin, actually. So I did I did re- re- rehash everything with him. He basically made many of the same points as in the part one with you. Mm. But yeah, I got I got to inject some of my two cents, and and that's that. I think it's a great show. I did. I'm I'm not just sure it was a necessary show. <laughs> But uh, then you told me something. That, oh, I want to discuss it. You were pretty stoked on the uh, that hypothesis for a while earlier this year, but you never told me what it is that you were fired up about. So, if you remember, well, well, you know, first thing I have to say is I think you're downplaying the show. You did a fantastic <laughs> job, and I remember telling you that you know you were like, "Hey, I wasn't sure I should go into this for all those reasons." It's been done, mm. and no, you guys covered so much territory and you did bring your unique perspective to it and kind of bounce that off of him and you know the interesting thing just so we remind people who Riz Verk is because he's a super interesting guy yeah very technically competent uh is one of the founders of the MIT Massachusetts Institute of Technology game lab you know this is like one of the top tech universities in the world, certainly in in the United States. And here is a guy who is just right in the inner workings of that and was super successful as an entrepreneur, as a game developer, right? So he has this advanced degree from MIT and he's a game developer. And I think he sold like something like 20,000 apps, game apps, before he was 25 years old. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. very competent, very rich, and then you know went on to do venture capital deals and stuff like that. But also, his name, Rizwan Verk, we don't even, I don't know his full name, I'm sure it's not Verk, it's the full Indian, you know, 15 syllable kind of thing, but they <laughs> mercifully shortened it for the rest of us. But he's very knowledgeable on traditional Indian spirituality, and he's writing a book on that right now. Is it Yogananda? The Yogananda folks have kind of mm. hired him to do something. So I think you guys had a lot to connect with on that show. You know, my yeah, and I'm I'm happy I'm going to have him back for his second book, which is uh, more the multiverse take. And I want to say another thing that I didn't get to say in that show, and that's that he is all this, but for our listeners, take note, he's also the producer of some great indie movie uh, documentaries. One of them is Thrive, What on Earth Does It Take, or something like that is the title. And the other one is Serious About Free Energy. So he's really a, good, a so-called angel investor, a good guy. Okay, so there's two parts of that, angel investor and good guy. They don't always go hand in hand, but I'll, I'll take your, he seems like a good guy. He seems like a light versus dark kind of person, although we all make up both elements of that, yeah, which yeah. is something we can talk about. You know, the the, the pushback I had with, uh, with Riz, and I still have with the simulation hypothesis is it's stretching the metaphor, I kind of think. Mm. The other term I always use is backdoor materialism. If the ultimate reality that we're discovering scientifically is that we should not rely on our understanding of time and space, which is what the science comes back and tells us. That's what quantum physics tells us over and over again, is don't trust your measurements because they can get all screwed up with entanglement and experimenter effect and double slit and all that stuff. It just comes back and says, don't trust your version of reality. Yeah. Well, we can't accept that fully and then turn around and say, oh, but 
it is a computer simulation because computers are in time space, right? Mm -hmm. Computers by definition are in time space. They cannot be otherwise. The computer is constantly measuring time. It's constantly slicing it into these little slices and arranging it in a linear fashion. So we can't come to the scientific conclusion that we're coming to over and over again is that consciousness is somehow outside of space time and then try and jam it back in and say, yes, but it is a simulation. And that simulation mm. is essentially a computer that is in space time. Mm -hmm. I'll get that. See, this is why I always regard the computer as a red herring. When I emphasize, when I emphasize this theory, I'm not concerned about the computer. The only reason we need that is so to get the materialist on board to open up enough to try to comprehend it. And and if that's achieved, then we can leave the computer. Uh, well, the interesting thing with the computer- Well, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, mm -hmm. hold on. I can't mm -hmm. let you go on that okay, because okay, you're okay. kind of you're kind of slip sliding there. Mm -hmm. It is, how would you construct the simulation, quote unquote, without a computer? Certainly uh, Riz isn't. Riz, his book, which you guys talked extensively about, mm -hmm. is again and again, painting uh, or drawing our attention to the parallels between computer simulation as he is part you know he as he's deeply involved with yeah. from a gaming perspective and our reality as we understand it the rendering of reality yeah i'll answer that i knew you were i got it i got that was where we were going and my attempt to to explain that is as follows now if you looked at a computer Let's see what it really does in this case. It um, interferes with our senses. It is a generator that creates boundaries for our senses. So it creates patterns. It creates geometric experience. So it partitions space, so to speak. Now, for me, the computer is not key to this uh, theory. Mm. For me, the computer is a metaphor in this theory, more than a metaphor. It's an analogy. Because you can have something generating the experience of space and time for that matter. You can have something uh, interfering with those frequencies of our senses. And our senses, I'm talking our consciousness here, because it's not in the perception channels itself it happens. It's in the experience of the impulses that the perception channels generate for us. So... A computer is a crude, material, low-frequency kind of attempt. It's like we are sto Stone Age people and just picking up the club, and we're looking at this as a tool. Of course, it's a very rudimentary tool. It's still a tool. Uh, if you open yourself to perspectives like divinity or, or to higher dimensions, etc., then we're talking about something generating boundaries uh -huh. and manipulating light so that those frequencies, which we, for some suspicious reasons, are limited to, makes us experience this illusion of, of uh, a 3D, 4D, if you add time, reality. That's basically what's going on. That is the generator. Now, if you want to call that a computer, if you want to call it... Uh, you know, the finger of God, whatever. But it's something created, it's something generated that is manipulating our perception of existence. It's actually limiting our uh, perception of existence. Exactly the same thing would happen if we had, and we don't have, and I don't know even if we get there, but if we had advanced enough computers to manipulate us so that we forget where we are and we think we're inside a new reality, then mission achieved. You understand? No, wait a minute. Say, so yeah, I understand, but you're again kind of mashing a bunch of stuff together that doesn't necessarily go together. And this is mm -hmm. when I had the pushback. My pushback on Riz was, "You're stretching the metaphor too far. Aren't you stretching the metaphor too far?" And he didn't kind of like that because people who really are into the simulation theory do not believe that it's metaphorical. They believe you kind of went around the world there with your thing. Because when you wound up at the end was eventually there might be this supercomputer that really does do the simulation, which is where Riz is going. All that, though, is dependent on 
chopping up space and time and measuring shit. Yeah, yeah, so you yeah. can't have it both ways. You can't say it's a crude metaphor, but it's also the correct metaphor once we advance technology enough. So yeah, I, 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 I just think we have to be more precise in what we're saying. If you, and where I, where I land on it is that the ultimate reality that I think you and I have a sense for is so much greater yeah, yeah. that it can never be reduced down to this puny simulation computer. Is it? A no, no. Uh, I, I will go officially on the stand saying, I don't believe we are trapped in a computer game. What I'm saying is, I think we could create a computer game that could trap our consciousness. Not our consciousness in terms of no. the cost to it, but uh, if you put someone physically in jail, Alex, and they only have like five uh, quadrant meter to move about, you're kind of doing the same thing. You're confining their perceptions, which will influence their consciousness, which is why people get uh, destroyed in jail. So take take Nelson Mandela and lock him in solitary confinement for two yeah. years. And what yeah. do you get? You get this extraordinary human being who comes out and says, it was nothing. True. I traversed the universe and I came to yep. this. Yep. Lock Mahatma Gandhi in the same cell. And what does he say? It was nothing. I traversed the universe. Yeah, but these it, aren't these aren't the run of the mill people. These are the exceptions. It doesn't matter. They are not the exceptions. That ability to they are neo. N n no, prison neo. They are not. They are they. No, they are all of us. The light shines through all of us. The power is within all of us, True. and we merely we're just trying to figure out better ways to refine it, tap into it, and move it. Yeah, yeah. But but now you're missing you're missing the point man uh, the point no, is no i'm uh, i'm making the point the point is don't buy into this idea that they are going to be able to limit our consciousness by mm. jabbing us in the arm by sticking a vr thing around our eyes or any of the rest of this the 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 field of consciousness that we are a part of is an infinitely infinite times greater brighter more dynamic than any of this puny stuff and we may not be experiencing that on a day-to-day -day level because you know this is a pretty heavy time that we're in but yeah. to me i'm not speaking like a preacher i'm speaking it this is the real this is your reality as well this is what the uh, uh, esoteric the 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 deep wisdom has told yep. us all along is that everyone has the ability to transcend yeah i agree but um, the 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 challenge for the controllers the satanists the whatever you want to call it the materialists the transhumanists is to try to reduce that effect that's greatly annoying to them that Everything always points to consciousness. Consciousness is key, mind over matter. It's Plato beating up Aristotle on a daily basis. But that doesn't mean Aristotle can't find some devices to trick people into, because that, this is the thing. If we are gods, then it's all about making us forget that we are gods, actually making us believe we are not gods, actually making us believe that our ruler is gods. That's the story of history of mankind. Yes. Now, yes. what I'm saying about the computer is that, yeah, I totally think they can invent the computer that, I don't know, sedate someone, whatever you do to make them forget uh, or, or break down their identity and then wake up in this. I could see that uh, 10 years down the road, 20 down, years down the road, that the potential of such a te technology could exist. I'm not saying that makes a new world and this world is great. No, it's going to be a, but a shadow of a shadow of the world we're living in. But who's to say we're not already living in a shadow of a shadow? Because you have gone deep into near-death experiences. Everybody ex describe it as how Neo would uh, describe it if he woke up from the Matrix. It's like a total new sense of reality. It's like more real than this reality. But then it's also this uh, uh, this ecstatic feeling of, you know, coming home, all that stuff. So yes. in many ways, this fantastic, brilliant, beautiful reality we are in now, you need to try to imagine that that, as good as it is, can be but a shadow of an even greater reality. And in that perspective 
I can envision something worse than this reality, a deeper hell, if you like, that absolutely we can create because we can create hells. I don't know about paradises. We don't have a good track record for that, but we have a good track record for hell. So yeah, we could make a lower vibration mirror as above, so below, but that doesn't mean it's identical. It just means that it's a spiral and that you know, 10 o'clock on every spiral is the same, only on uh, lower levels. So yeah, I think we can create lower levels of reality. I think we can immerse ourselves into that. I think it can be used against us. It doesn't have to be a good thing. And I think that's just our, dis uh, our principal design of reality because there's nothing human beings can do or can't do that's not already uh, a potential template for. So if we do something, it means it's already allowed in existence. And yeah, I think we can imitate the creator and do a diabolic kind of mockery of creation, which is the transhumanist sweatest dream, right? Well, yeah. Oh boy. I have a lot to say about transhumanism and that could be one of the the moments, one of the moments from uh, 2022 of Skeptico. And it definitely would be one of my top moments, but you seem, but tell me, where Forum Borealis has run into the transhumanist agenda and how that has spun for you in 2022. Yeah. Well, uh, more than anything, uh, via COVID, of course, that's where where we all see it. Uh, and, uh, and you've seen those alien blood clots people are infected with? Yeah. It's insane. It's been in the papers here too. But this year, I've done something I haven't done uh, since I started. I've had three UFO shows this year. Oh, wow. Kind of four if you if you lump in the simulation theory, because that can <laughs> fit with everything, right? So, and I think UFOs also tangents the transhumanism topic. But I think we should start uh, with the traditional segue to it. You had a great show with uh, uh, Mr. Cox, this Brit who runs the, what's it called? Um, consciousness. Deep State Consciousness Podcast. Yeah. The Richard Cox thing. Um, so I guess I figured out how to get you to listen to Skeptico. <laughs> I just have to schedule an end of yeah. year. No, no, I have listened to Skeptico this year, but um, I've heard half that show. And it's very interesting, you know, th those who deny the virus, uh, one uh, obvious hypothesis is that they are running into the classical flat earth trap, right? That they become, yes. that they, because they know the powers that be in any area know that there will always be a certain amount of opposition. It doesn't matter. Even if they're right, there will be opposition. So how can we, how can we derail most of this opposition? They, they always have to muddy the waters like vaccines the number one psyop trap inside the vaccine there's uh, microchips or something like that right and nobody really believes that but that's how you derail all vaccine criticism and i see that totally the same could be done by viruses that okay if people deny there's a virus then they deny themselves out of the debate and we've taken care of most of the criticism the criticism would be stronger if these people hadn't you know, divorce themselves from this reality. So I totally get your point there. Well, you you maybe do, but if we're, I, we kind of jumped to a different topic because I think transhumanism relates to a, 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 another issue. And we'll get back to that with Dean Radin, which I think is just oh, yeah. that shocked it's phenomenal. Me too. It's, yeah. it's, it's, well, it speaks directly to the transhuman issue. So I don't know if we should jump there, but you brought up the no virus thing. Yeah, let's do the COVID things first, okay? So let get it over with so it doesn't take the whole show. Okay. Well, it, it still might wind up taking the whole show because it's really kind of a, a major turning point for me, kind of one of, a, a, one of a handful of moments on Skeptico that I can really point to that totally changed my perspective on everything. Mm. Um, do I have the ability to play a clip into the show? Try. So let's play this and see how it goes. On this episode of Skeptico. Rabies. Damn rabies. A woman shouldn't have to be hit by a car to learn that she may have rabies. But that is where we are in America. 
and that does not sit right with me. And that is why I am hosting a fun run race for the cure for rabies to raise awareness of the fact that there is a cure for rabies, a disease that has been largely eradicated in the US, but not very many people know that. There is simply no proof that there is a virus called rabies that causes the dogs to go nuts. There's just, there is no scientific proof of that. That's a story. So, of course, that first clip was Steve Carell from The Office. But the second one was from today's guest, Michael Wallach, who joined me to talk about his new documentary series, The Viral Delusion. Hope you enjoy the show. Okay, so a a lot to talk about. I guess I'm going to try and jam it all in here because I've opened this can of worms. Here's the moment for me. I, as you know, from the last end of your show we did, I kind of stepped into this pile of material on the ground last year in 2021 when I interviewed first uh, <laughs> oh gosh. Um, who I, I interviewed you. Tom Cowan I interviewed a doctor Tom Cowan who mm. is a viral denier and uh, before that I interviewed David Ike who really kick the thing off and everybody knows david ike but what a lot of hang people- on i heard one show with you back in the uh, when covid was strong uh, there was this guy you were discussing masks tom cowan that was called tom cowan yeah yeah so the 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 origin of this to just kind of do the whole thing uh david ike i had david ike on the show and i've always thought david ike was so in- incredibly he's like so many of these figures in this alt media community that we're a part of where he he's done incredible incredible body of work he's opened people's eyes minds hearts up in so many ways but he also seems to dump a lot of bullshit along the way he's either self-deluded or he just I don't know what the deal is. But anyways, I'm interviewing him and I go, hey, you seem to be pitching this I know virus thing. I go, come on, David, what's up with that? I said, even you back when they did the swine flu thing said that this is a manufactured bioweapon. Why have you? And Mm. in typical David Icke fashion, he was kind of like he had to pause and remember that, yeah, that was he, he he was right, you know, he was right with mm. the swine flu 10 years ago. And now he's been hoodwinked into these crazy no virus people who say, you know, there is no virus. It's terrain theory, you know, germ theories out, terrain theory. So anyways, I interviewed Tom Cowan, the most hated interview I've had. People are like, <laughs> my God, you didn't let this guy talk. You know, mm. I, you mm. shut him down. And it's part of this thing I have of don't suffer fools gladly, you know, mm. and that has come up. That has been one of the themes of the last half of 2022. The Bible might be full of shit, but there's a lot of good stories in there. And one of the great stories is when well, Paul writes these letters to these outlying camps who've heard the good news. And he, he sarcastically says, oh, but you guys wouldn't care because you suffer fools gladly. You don't mind if people come on and say all sorts of stupid things at your meeting. So why do I care kind of thing? Mm. And it's worked its way into our society. We all understand, you know, some people think we should suffer fools gladly. If you want to be up and be a knuckle dragger and talk about flat earth and you want to be Eddie Bravo, who's a great guy. And you want to talk to (laughs) Joe Rogan, great guy, but they want to be knuckle draggers and they're proud of the fact that they're kind of anti-intellectual and they've never gone to college and they don't really know science, but they're, you know, hey, I got an opinion. Everyone's got an opinion. Great. The problem with that is that science does have something to bring to the table. Yeah. And the other, because I don't really care about any of that shit because everyone does have an opinion. Everyone can talk, debate, you know, whether whether Norway or the Swiss have the better downhill skiers and that's, you know, you can sit around Mm. at the pub and you talk about that shit all day long or politics or stuff like that. What I've always tried to do on Skeptico is expose something deeper, something on a spiritual level or something on a very uh, covert manipulation, misinformation level. This is all a lead in, Al. And the reason I wouldn't let you jump in there is because we got to, I have to finish this whole thing out mm-hmm. and it's going to mm-hmm. take a, another couple minutes. Sure. So this is the lead in to me constantly being kind of barraged by these no virus people go, Alex, you know, you're so stupid. There are no viruses there. And I go, that is just ridiculous. It's flatter science. Quit 
pitching that? How can, and, and I, I'm like, you have to step up your game because you're dragging the whole system down <clears throat> in the way that you obviously saw, you know, they are dividing you by creating this whole segment of wacky conspiracy theorists that they can all point to and laugh and you're joining in and letting them do it. So finally, I, I said, if you have someone who's credible, who wants to come on and talk, I will actually have them on. Yeah. Long-winded story. Good, good or skeptical, always taking on anyone. Yes, Al, yes. But this is where my whole world changes. Somebody says, here's a guy, he has this new documentary, Viral Delusion. Mm -hmm. It's a well-made documentary. It features a lot of credible, it would seem, real medical doctors. Mm -hmm. So I contact Michael Wallach and I, I first, I, so I contact him and I first, he agrees to do the interview and he's very nice and accommodating. And I do a search, a background search on him and I don't really find anything on Michael Wallach. I go, mm. that's okay. So then I send him an email and this was a little bit very out of character with me, but I, I wanted to find a way to just tell this story in a way that people would understand. And I thought the way to do it would be to say, to, to turn it to the rabies. Because we've all known for hundreds of years that when the dog, you know, dogs get rabies, right? So mm -hmm. I sent, I sent Michael this email, and in the email I told him the story about my dog when I was a kid who played in the forest and then came back, and a few days later he was foaming at the mouth, and we took him to the vet, and the oh, vet wow. said, "I'm sorry, your dog has rabies. We have to put him down." And I right. said, "Oh, that was so heartbreaking for me." And Michael emails me back and says, "Sorry to hear about your dog." Your dog didn't have rabies. Mm. There's no such thing as rabies. Your dog probably had worms. Mm. And at this point, my thought is this guy is retarded. I mean, this guy has <laughs> limited, uh, that's within the, to be honest, that was my thought. This guy has limited intellectual capabilities and I should kind of take it easy on him in this interview because in the process of making, of exposing him, I'm just gonna make everybody hate me even more. So I do the interview with Wallach, and if you heard the intro to that interview that I just played there, no, 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 no. He is not a slack-jawed idiot. He's incredibly well-spoken. He's also a great at spinning stories. He's a conversationalist, and he has a, a lightness about him, and he tells, and he's very well-educated. And this whole thing, as I'm doing the interview, you know, you and I have done a lot of interviews. We can pick up a lot on people, mm. and I'm like, wow. What is going on here? And then I do decide to go into the rabies thing and I go, come on, you know, it's ridiculous. We all know, I mean, rabies, really? And he just pounds it, he pounds it home. No, there are no viruses. And as a matter of fact, you brought it up and rabies never existed in this night. But here's the point of the story. I get off of the interview and I go, what is going on here? And I start searching and this is just bad, <laughs> poor uh, background checking on my part, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but I search for Mike Wallach and suddenly Mike Wallach pops up. Mike Wallach has an undergraduate degree from, from the top Ivy League schools in the United States. Mike Wallach has a master's degree from Columbia. And if anyone's tuned into the Alphabet Soup Intelligence Agency breeding ground, Columbia is one mm. of the places. Mike Wallach had an internship with Barack Obama where he was preparing <laughs> briefings for Barack Obama fellowship. Can you, do you know how exclusive that mm. would be? Do you mm. know how many people out of a million you're talking about that have an mm. undergraduate uh, degree from an Ivy League school, master's degree from Columbia, fellowship that has them doing personal presentations to Barack Obama? But then he leaves. He leaves Washington to go to Hollywood to make films. The first film he makes is with a major Hollywood director. And the film you can watch that I played or mm -hmm. I, I gave to people is a horror film about a very infectious disease that causes panic among a, the large part of the population. I forget the name of it. It's five, six years ago. You can look it up. Mm -hmm. His second film. So he is a fast track guy. His second film. Oh, it's this hokey little viral delusion thing that can't even be on any of the major platforms because it's too controversial and is uh, just directly focused on talking 
to this little subgroup that you and I are familiar with, this little mm. alt media subgroup that thinks there's no viruses. Was this before COVID? No, this is uh, 2022. Mm. So my world shifted because I think I was talking to a guy who's on the job, on the job, if you know what that means. Like it's an expression that they we use in the United States, like when one cop runs across another cop and the cop's undercover and he's mm. doing something that he's not supposed to be doing, mm. he goes, pal, I'm on the job. Mm. And then there's a wink and a nod and everybody just goes on their own way. Mm. So I don't know. I have no idea. I have no idea. Mm -hmm. Is Mike Wallach on the job? I don't know. Does he really believe everything in the viral delusion? I have no idea. Does he have an undergraduate degree, a master's from Columbia? Was he a fellow with, mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah. I, so, so at this point, so the really, the important afterthought and why I've paused kind of skeptico is so I go and talk to Richard Cox, who also interviewed Mike Wallach. Mm. Richard Cox, who's been on my show multiple times. Richard Cox, who used to work for me doing booking on Skeptico because I like him and I honor and respect the work he's done. He totally falls for the whole thing. He totally, he is, uh, he's unshakable. He's unshakable now. He's converted over to the- You mean after, after your interview with him? Because he wasn't that unshakable in the interview itself. He was unshakable. Yes, he's kind of downplaying it. He did his own interview with Mike Wallach. He goes and does presentations to folks at churches or wherever showing Wallach's film. Mm. Okay. He is, so the, the, this is where- He's invested in it. Yeah, and so what does that mean? What does that mean for, you know, you and I are sitting here talking about how they're doing this, how they're going to do this, and they're going to- Man, it don't take much. People start doing it to themselves. So yeah, it's always been like that. Yeah, what do you think of that whole whole story? What do you What are your thoughts? Oh boy. Well, we're entitled to our own opinions, but we're not entitled to our own facts. I know that's right. a cliche, but it actually matters. So I was kind of following Richard Cox when he said, "Like, where is your?" I'm sympathetic to that attitude. Where is your pain threshold? What would it take for you to reassess a certain paradigm that you have been invested in, right? And I can tell you where it goes for me when it comes to this virus things, because I haven't picked up uh, this uh, side show. I haven't uh, monitored it enough. So I don't even know what their scientific argument is. But I can make a case for the no virus theory uh, without knowing what they're making. And magically, it will fit with the virus theory too. And it goes like this. There are scientific experimentation within the forbidden parts of science. With that, I mean everything to do with electromagnetics. And I forgot to tell you in our former topic that uh, the electromagnetic scale may be the closest we get to an existential computer. But there is a fact that they can monitor, they can measure viruses by vibration. And uh, this guy, this genius Frenchman, uh, what did, did he get the Nobel Prize for? I forgot, but he's really in the vanguard of frequency science, which is, again, a taboo part of science. It went black after the Second World War because it decodes so much, including UFOs. So they could, uh, he could transfer a virus via, what was it, radio or something, with taking the signature, the vibration signature, beaming it, uh, half uh, across the globe, and then it pops up in water, which is a good conductor, right? Yeah. At the receiver end. Now, some people may take this and run with it. Ah, there's no viruses. All viruses are just frequencies. It's just dissonant frequencies. It's, it's frequencies that are in, in disharmony with uh, the frequencies that we need uh, of life, blah, blah, blah. They would be right. But you would also be right to say, no, no, there are still viruses because this is the classical particle versus wave debate just in a new manifestation. So they are both vibrations, frequencies, and they are also entities because when you measure the entities, because everything is vibrations. So when you measure anything's vibration, 
you're you're talking about both particles. It's particles when you examine it in time and space, and when you don't examine it, we're back to quantum, right? To Schrodinger's cat. Then it's a potential anything. So I, I always thought it was retarded if this was the argument they were using because it's it's not an either or. It's a both and. Yes, it is vibrations. Yes, you can interfere with viruses thanks to vibrations. Tesla did it. Rife did it. Many did it. And you can also kill. Uh, or, 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 or dissolve those frequencies with vibrations. But it doesn't mean that when it manifests in your body, it doesn't behave like viruses and it spreads and infects like viruses. Yeah, totally. So I'm on both sides of that argument. Now, I don't know if this is... Can you explain to us basically the gist of how they deny viruses? Is it this angle or is it something else? Um. I, I like I step back and look at the process of because I would it's analogous to uh, flat earth in that what it really is I think it's this uber empiricism it's this it's the net result of what they've done in junkifying science so where we all are with science now is we don't trust science because they lie about science consistently. And I would say that the way that flat earth was used was a setup for global warming and a setup for COVID, right? Because if you get people in their bones saying, you know it all nerds have screwed everything up. I'm not trusting a damn thing you're saying. And let me give you the most in your face example of how much I don't trust you. I think the earth is flat. Prove me wrong. Mm. And that's all it takes. And you just extend that. So as it relates to particularly terrain theory versus germ theory, and we've talked about it on the show, but it's a ridiculous proposition at the surface, right? It's the same as flat earth. It doesn't deserve serious discussion and to be to be drawn into whether or not because terrain theory by the way you know and in the richard cox interview it doesn't come out they also deny bacteria it's not like they just it's it's not like they just deny uh viruses bacteria is in there too you know mm -hmm. so all the all the thousands and thousands of peer-reviewed paper in virology they want to throw all that out the window but so it, it isn't like hey let's really try and understand their theory no it's like the famous guy said it's not even wrong it doesn't <laughs> even yeah. rise to the level of of that so right. the deeper part is how does it function inside of the deception how does it function inside of the misinformation system which you started with al you immediately got that you immediately yeah. we might not actually agree 100 percent on that but that's immediately where you went which is like oh okay this is another way to you know divide and rule yeah. people no i i see that potential reality the problem here alex is that we are trying to decode i wish we were like limited to baseball it would be so much easier to discuss but we have like a multi-dimensional perspective when we discuss anything you and me and uh, obviously within the socio-political reality or if you want to indulge the retarded uh, expression conspiracy theory or hypothesis yes obviously this, whether it is or not, it would be a wonderful psyop. And yes, it would uh, fit all the bills. But my problem is, I can I can play the devil's lawyer here if you like, if you can handle that, because I can go to I can look at it ontologically, and let's say no, let's indulge the hypothesis model. You realize that in the hypothesis model, uh, I mean the simulation model. <laughs> uh, Earth can be flat, spheric, and hollow at the same time. And you don't need to go to the computers. Let's go to the Gnostics. They said it's the consciousness that matters. So if everyone believes that there was a holy man who was sacrificed on a cross, if that power base in the Vatican can get enough people to envision that with their whole soul, with all their senses, it's so real, I can touch it. I can, there's Jesus, I can see him then it becomes real in the simulation. That's how weird 
reality could be. I'm, I'm not, now, now we're not even talking about a machine. Now I'm talking if you go to egregores, right? And UFOs can be a manifestation, et cetera. Yeah. That's how weird reality could be. And in that same vein, you could also say that, yeah, it's viruses and it's not viruses. How many believe it's viruses? Bam, it's shifting. They say someone just uh, got the Nobel Prize for proving that the past doesn't exist. <laughs> so what on earth are those traumas we are having? What on earth are these sweet memories we are having? How can the, those be generated and then stop existing? Could we change our past by embracing intensely a new reality of what happened? Could you take a trauma and then make it to some, something good, for example, and then that will start manifesting in the eternal now? So the, now I'm I'm just exploding all boundaries, okay, in our paradigm. I'm taking it this far. Now, you want me to rewind back into that sociopolitical box? I'm with you. This is, and if it's not a psyop, it uh, immediately becomes one. They hijack it. They invest in this. They see how useful for example, flat earth rebellion is. But, you know, they are not these perfect puppet masters that we always envision them to be. They're bungling things left and right all the time because of the your argument, the X factor called consciousness. They're not in control of consciousness. Consciousness is like this deluge thrown at them, and they are desperately trying to use duct tape to, you know, fill in the holes and, uh, oh, it's coming through, it's coming through, okay, bam, over there. This is how they're operating. And many things they're doing backfires. If we go to traditional politics, I love the Duran. Here's a shout out for the Duran if you want some sober analysis. Just within the geopolitical realm, that's it. Nothing alternative beside that. But they have they gave us the straight facts and then we can opinionate around it. And we see how they're bungling. Now BRICS is taking over for the petrodollar. And this is going against the Great Reset. It's going against the... Western or, or uh, Anglo-American elites. So they are not these perfect puppet masters. In fact, I'm with uh, our friend uh, uh, Schneider on this. He thinks that uh, all this inbreeding and, you know, they needed people like Epstein who actually, they need people who are competent because they are utterly incompetent at this point. They just have the power, the will and the money. And then they need to... Um, circle, uh, uh, have in their circle uh, different kinds of geniuses who have no ethics, who will implement their vi uh, vision for them. So, okay, I went all over the place. Uh, I'll, I'll shut up now and let you comment. Well, uh, bring it bring it home for me and tell me what you think about um, how you think that how you think that relates. Well, I, I think um, at a weird level, Anything could be possible if enough people believe it uh, or become possible. Uh, the, but what would you do with that understanding? See, because to me, that's always like a uh, good, good point. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. No, great question. Because, you know, the answer to that is it doesn't matter. What would I do with it? It's an information war. So I would still behave as if viruses are real. The earth is not flat. And we have to fight for those ideas. Why? Because that's the shortest way to get to the uh, target, to where I want society to go. It doesn't serve me or you or anyone else that we have to take this enormous detour around. I can do it in private. If you, you and me are sitting here having a coffee, we can discuss, okay, what would it take for the earth to be round? Okay, because that has no consequence. But if 30% of the population believes it's round, and meanwhile, they do, they, they're they doing deep level, third dimensional chess warfare on us. Oh, my God, we need that brain power, you know, to what matters. So I'm a both end guy here. Uh, we should behave as if uh, things are as we think it is and, and continue fighting that battle because it is also that. It, 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 this is also a reality. And this is where the battle is taking place. For example... The battle is much more served that we acknowledge our, our coronavirus and we acknowledge that they are fucking us up with the vaccines and we acknowledge that the pandemic has been poorly handled, to put it mildly. If we do that, that's what's serving the immediate battle going on. But in addition, I can see other potential realities. Do you understand? 
I do, but I think you're climbing the, you know, the last time we spoke for the end of the year, you had a great metaphor about climbing the mountain yeah. and going around. And as you get higher and higher, you can see people further down below. And some of them are just going around the mountain again and again and again. Yeah, and yeah. some of them are, in fact, even though they're going around the mountain, they're kind of choosing the path that takes them higher and higher. I agree with what you said, that we, we do have to have discernment in terms of uh, bracketing reality, which is the way I put it. There is a consensus reality here. And in that consensus reality, viruses do exist and cause disease. In that bracketed reality, at the same time, we have a very incomplete understanding of viruses. Mm. And we have a medical industrial complex that has exploited the yeah. limited understanding we have of viruses, and they've twisted it and turned it and developed all sorts of misinformation. The whole HIV AIDS thing is real. There is a real dispute there in terms right. of what is the relationship between the testing for HIV and the AIDS virus. I had a guy on seven years ago on Skeptico, and he said that he said, you know, the numbers do not make any sense. The pure numbers that we get back on the demographic numbers, people who go Dr. Okay. Henry Bauer shouted for a great show. Yeah. So, so I'm down with the fact that they are screwing with the data because they don't really know what's going on with viruses. But that doesn't, we're saying the same thing here, that doesn't give somebody permission to jump outside, uh, jump outside of the bounded consensus reality and say, hey, man, maybe, you know, there's no such thing. No, that w we have this bounded consensus reality. And then we have all the stuff. Yeah, that there's a time and a place for every debate, right? They are polluting the real debate here with that thing. Uh, it doesn't belong in the COVID uh, policy debate. Seriously, it, it, it belongs in, you know, pipe smoking societies, cigar smoking societies in front of the fireplace. But, uh, but the real but the real problem for you and I, Al, is mm -hmm. that once we jump out of that discussion and say, OK, you're a deeper thinker, let's really talk about the mountain, you know, because that's mm -hmm. what it's really about and our mm -hmm. path up that mountain. Mm -hmm. Well, then now we have to come back and say you're using terms like battle and that. And does that really make any sense? from a mountain perspective are we really battling yeah. you know the it does the say i'm not sure that i'm not sure that it does i'm not sure i'll tell I, you why because there's a million uh, forces who wants you to not uh, climb that mountain and they want to lure you back into the woods so only for that Shriram, and you know it's an individual it's an individual journey too it's not a collective one on to the top Shiram, Jaram, Jai Jaram. I probably am not pronouncing that in a way that anyone who really understands Sanskrit no. understands. But I love the the translation of that. May the light in virtue in my heart be victorious. Mm. To me, that is the only real battle. Okay. The only real battle is right. I have the light and the virtue, the virtuous in my heart okay but brother let, let me rephrase it then there's also a million forces inside you who wants to not right climb on. that mountain so there's always going to be a battle ice bath whether it's outside or inside it doesn't matter ice it's bath. all the same ice bath That's the, <laughs> sir. no but look man it's uh the, the COVID reality is super important because um you, you've been following the developments, and uh, I have a hellish scenario for you. And that's that. And, and, and I don't know what I predicted last year, but I suspect I should have predicted it for the coming year because uh, we have now a situation where uh, there may be a lot of deaths accumulating. I don't want to make it into some doomsday scenario, but um, it's incredible, uh, you know, how how immediate, how literal all the naysayers and the anti-vaxxers, if you look at it objectively, it's taken a really left turn. Um, time for time for prediction, time for reminding okay. you of your prediction from last year. Mm -hmm. You ready? Yep. Because it relates directly to what you're talking about. Your prediction mm -hmm. at the end of the, our last year's show was that 
this is Al speaking, I think Omnichrome could be the silver bullet, not your language, but say, and you, you really expounded on it in a really interesting way, because we were talking about how the Western world was vaccinated, but Africa wasn't vaccinated, India wasn't vaccinated, mm. not to the extent that they would have liked anyway. Mm. And where does Omnichrome seem to kind of emerge out of these areas that have resisted vaccination for long periods of time? And you said, I think this could be a game changer because, you know, herd immunity, natural immunity, blah, blah, blah. But then you also painted the dark scenario, but it could turn the other way and that they just further kind of double down on the whole thing. Yeah. I would, so I would take your prediction, which isn't, you kind of covered all the bases. So I don't know if you really get total credit for that, but I mm -hmm. think you pointed us in a really important direction. And I think that direction applies here. Mm -hmm. Yes, the vaccine has uh, probably dealt a really severe blow to the immune system of hundreds of millions of people. There's no question about that. Yeah. God has a couple tricks up his sleeve, too. He has ways that, and he, I'm obviously, I don't believe that there's some entity in on the cloud with a beard. and I With a dick. Yeah, yeah, and I certainly <laughs> don't believe, yeah, he sees. But, but the, 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 you, get the, you get the idea, is that no, they, they will not, they will not determine the future of mankind by their hokey little, poorly run, project of manufacturing a bioweapon in a lab. That will not be the end of the road. They will not determine that. It will be determined through some other means. Yeah, but have you heard the news? I, I've heard. Yeah, of what's going on in Boston? Oh, my God. You heard it, right? They're amping it up to 80% mortality. And they're doing it with impunity. Yeah. Where the fuck are the pitchforks? Why do you take COVID that was failed? For? Because if the pandemic is as the worst conspiracy hypothesis, as saying that they wanted this, uh, or it was a trial run or whatever, then now they have the perfect thing. Because if the virus had worked as they wanted us to believe it worked, then uh, these uh, people who, you know, the branch COVIDians who have cracked their brains on, on COVID fear, Everybody will become like them. It will become hell on earth. Fear is going to uh, run rampant because now we will have real, real grounds for it. Because if 80% died, in reality, 0.8% died, and they would have died if it was a hard flu, too. This we know now. We didn't know it in the beginning. But if 80% died, which is what they've done now with the COVID virus in Boston. Right. Jesus Christ, man. That's how. Well, I d d don't. Right. Uh, that is a that is a potential reality. Ebola is another potential reality that we've lived with. Right. That has yeah. very high mortality. That's, that's just fifty percent, I think. Either way, it's the end of the world. Yeah. Fifty or eighty does not make a difference. Nope. If you have fifty percent or eighty percent, it's still the end of the world yep. as we know it. So the the other side of this, which you know, we could have. We could talk for a long time. We could do a bunch of shows. Mm -hmm. But if if you look at where we're going economically, and we've talked a little bit about the Bitcoin and the crypto thing oh, as yeah. part of that, and I think it also relates to uh, world economies and uh, currencies and stuff like that. The, the end game there is not turning out the way that they want. They're not going to be no. able to print $30 trillion in Echo currency, like they were planning on doing, that was the plan. You mean you mean digital currency, right? What did I say? I don't know. What did you say? Echo, echo. You know the environmental uh, uh, carbon trading. All you right, know, it's Eco. the same. Yeah. It's yeah, it's the same stuff, right? So, and now we have China on the ropes in terms of you know what's going on with. Who knows what's up with Biden and the chip thing? But did you see the thing with the chips where the... No. Okay. So <laughs> this is another little factoid that some people are claiming, and you could see it that it could possibly be true. Mm -hmm. The best microchips in the world, and there's a battle for them, something like 80% of them are produced where? Taiwan. Mm. Um, and Biden has just passed into law 
uh, an executive order saying that the Chinese will no longer have access to the best chips. This is trade war, major trade war. Yeah, if yeah. anyone hasn't heard of this, they need to go investigate it. And he said, and also he said, anyone who's working on these advanced chips and are in China has to come home. Yeah, I heard that. This, this shuts China down. They are shut down. If you don't have access to these chips, you, you can't do anything moving forward uh, in terms of your economy. You're just going to slowly. I heard they got them from Russia or something. No, the, 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 the 80% of them are made in Taiwan. Mm. And we have foundries here. And part of this thing was to make us self-sufficient and build all the foundries here. But we basically control that technology. You know, IBM just last year announced the two nanometer uh, kind of uh, integrated circuits. So and Moore's law, do you know what Moore's law is, how computer technology doubles and doubles yeah. every 18 months? Right. And they said that's coming to an end. Well, it's not coming to an end. They continue to have breakthroughs. There's no end in sight. But you have to be really smart. you got to invest a ton of money. And then when you have it, you have all sorts of patents and technology mm. that, you know, and our friend Bernardo Castro, the company he used to work for, is the foundry that makes all those chips. All that is in our hands, USA, USA, USA. <laughs> so <laughs> IBM owns that owns that technology. Intel owns that technology. So we're, we're now in a position to muscle China in a way that a lot of people didn't see coming. How does that play out? I don't know. What does that say to China buddying up with uh, Russia? I don't know. What does that say for the end of the dominance of the US dollar? I don't know. And the reason to go on that whole rant between two people that like to talk about spirituality is just to show how many other cards there are on the table mm. that need to be turned over if you're going to try and read the deck. So it's like it's yeah. never ending in yeah. terms of where this is going, how it's playing out, what the 80% in Boston really means, who's in charge, all the rest of that. Mm. And did the virus really come from America after all, like George Webb said here so early? No, it seems like it because the signature of it is from American labs. It seems like Wuhan got it from America. But yeah, you're right. And But this makes it exciting, doesn't it? Because it's like uh, the chips could fall anywhere. It's impossible to make any safe bets here. Uh, I will say that it's kind of good that America did this because it kind of proves that they have their uh, neck, the the, the 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 neck on the block. Because this is their new move to answer the other move. You know, the whole Ukraine thing. Uh, we shouldn't go too deep into it because it will take the whole show. There's so much to say about it, but it backfired to the Western elite. The Western elite pretends the whole world is uh, on, like it's the whole world against Russia. In reality, which people in the West won't know because we are completely brainwashed by our media, is that it's the whole world against Europe and USA, basically. And maybe you can toss Australia and Canada in there too. But the whole world has gone together. And this has been a slow thing. BRICS isn't a new thing. But what's really new now is that it's not just crazy, isolated crazies like uh, the Venezuela guy or uh, Gaddafi and all these people who talk about we have to create an independent currency to compete with the dollar. This is now officially the policy of BRICS. Brazil, Doesn't Russia. Matter. Then you well, didn't, you didn't, you did either didn't understand or don't agree with what I just said. No, but, I did because the reply is is to use the stuff in Taiwan as no, the bottleneck against them. No, the point is that the Fed, the United States Federal Reserve, as bad as it is, mm -hmm. as corrupt as owned by whoever, yeah, is still in control. There will be no move away from the U.S. currency. There, they, you do not. We haven't even begun. Turkey and and, and Saudi Arabia. I, they, they no. It just yeah. will. What they what they're demonstrating to me. One of the takeaways is there's a lot more power there than you might have thought. Yeah. And that was the problem. You know, when you were pitching me the Bitcoin thing mm. a year ago. And by the way, you know, your Bitcoin now has to 
basically triple in value for you to even get back to Brady break even. And please don't tell me that it's a good time to buy because you said it was a good time to buy at forty thousand. I'm buying like crazy. Oh, good. What are you doing with the stuff you bought at forty? The point is, th the United States, for good, bad, whatever understands that they have to control and dominate economically and they're not going to do that they're not going to let That's go right. of that without a fight no and the fight is so everyone was what i just told you about the chips thing what that should do for everyone and go look at the rivers that don't even have any water and the electricity that they can't do and there's zero tolerance policy on covid which is insane and is going to run the country into the ground and now reassess and say oh those are the guys that i thought a couple months ago were gonna knock the u.s currency off the top of the hill no way go look at where their currency is relative to the united states my wife just went to oktoberfest she stayed in the finest hotels for next to nothing because the dollar is stronger than it's ever been in my lifetime so a few months ago it was oh my the us dollar it's done the pet it don't that look that way now it could look totally different six months from now but just or a, a one month from now this is just a part of the battle man no. uh, you, you're very impressed by that move but uh, there are many moves going on yes they will of course they won't go down without the fight and uh, the fight will get dirty the fight is dirty the whole ukraine thing is a part of this they're basically sacrificing an entire country and europe is on the brink of collapse uh, Norway is the part of EU, but we are also suffering because our retarded politicians somehow feel loyalty to Europe. So that we have so much power here. We have oil, gas, we have waterfalls, we have wind, and they are giving it for free almost to Europe. And then they're buying it back expensively. So now I'm suffering too because of these morons. But um, Europe and, and Europe is waking up to being screwed by America because the America first bombs uh, the Nord Stream, both the new one and the old one. So now Germany has nothing. And then we, they say, hey, you can buy it from us. And then we buy it four times as much as the price. So they're squeezing. So even the loyal European uh, henchmen are starting to get cold feet and are, are having a very hard time dealing with the protests because there's protests all over the world now is just not being reported farmers are on the street because the great reset is happening in real time as we speak for uh, and i don't have time to go into it but they're screwing farmers big time huge corporations taking up everything so corporatism is the end game of the corporatism they're desperate now that's why i think they also have this covid thing in backhand in case they're really losing then they have to do something like that to just because Everything is coming home now to roost. They can't hide the vaccine damage anymore. People are waking up left and right, not just in China. I'm impressed by the Chinese raising up, but I'm just as impressed uh, with the, the raising up in uh, Australia, in Europe. Uh, we saw in Canada not long ago, the truckers, right? So yes. things are happening all over the place. And the, the rulers are in a squeeze because they have to fight the geopolitical battle at the same time they have to fight the inner battle against us the people and russia china and other countries abroad are actually supporting the uprise of the people in the west because they realize too that you know uh, this is a monolith that has to fall and uh, any country if you look at history the real fall of a power is from within if from without can help but there's always this uh, screw effect, you know, two front war. So I'm I'm not that imp I, I'm impressed. Yes, and I think they would even introduce UFOs and whatnot if they really are about to fall. They, everything would come out in the. Open. You don't you don't believe in UFOs. Yeah. Anyway, let's let's not get <laughs> I off. I do believe on... in a classified space program. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's it. Doesn't it's a non-starter to say I believe in a classified space program that has advanced technologies from UFOs, but I don't believe in UFOs and ETs, or I believe in UFOs, but I don't believe in ETs. It's logically inconsistent, but that's why I say we could do ten yeah. shows on all of this stuff. Should we segue to that? Well, you know, just to to wrap up the other thing because I think this is really, to me, the uh, the crux of the issue. Back to the mountain. Because yep. we can't forget that that's what 
drew us together. That's what bonds our deeper friendship yeah. when we have these discussions, because we do get at odds on some of the stuff down at the ground level. But the further we get up the mountain, then the further we just go, oh, yeah, OK, yeah, yeah. I see you, fellow seeker. I see you, fellow deep spiritual person. The problem I have with your continued analogy of the battle and hooray for the people who will rise up and do that is that back to what I was talking about, Eddie Bravo and Joe Rogan, you know, I mean, Sam is, well, he's a comedian. And so Eddie Bravo is, he's gone on tour with Eddie Bravo. Eddie mm. Bravo is one of the leading flat earth, you know, and I get it, man. They're just playing around. They're just, see, it's, it's like you said, which is that I understand the entertain, like I've been doing this for so long, the whole entertainment thing snuck up on me. Right. I didn't see it as, as that people are entertained mm. by people find entertainment from podcasting. I never looked for, I, I was foolish, naive enough to think that when I was listening to interviews, I was learning something. That was always my goal. Yeah. I never wanted to listen to someone to be entertained. I like being entertained, but I separate that. Infotainment, from... the most popular show, my brother was just visiting me and he's been opening his mind lately. And I'm surprised he's even a fan of me now. And I asked, what was it? It was the biggest podcast in Norway called Konspi Podden. What on earth is that? Well, they are entertaining conspiracy theories. And then I realized the game is pure entertainment. They have a new topic every week. And they always have this ironic distance to it, but they take it seriously enough to, you know, some of these uh, conspiracies they buy into. Exactly. But, but it's always this, this, see here, see this new shiny object we're showing you? Now a maze over that for a while, and then we put it back in the box and we find a new one next week and go on with your life and nothing matters. Exactly. And evil doesn't matter. Exactly. Right. Right. Exactly. That's how it is. I never saw that coming. No. Never saw that coming. I did because I was utterly entertained with Joseph Farrell's talks with um, this old lady. But it was pure info. But that's because I'm entertained by info. You understand? Right. But that's I, a great. That's a great point because I am too. I'm entertained by information. Yeah, but they need they need awe, shock and awe. But uh, one of the things I said about your show all this time was that. Um, I find when you get uh, uh, contesting with your guests, when you start to giving them a hard time, uh, especially the skeptics, that's the shows I find most entertaining. But when you have a so-called friendly interview, when you're like all all over the guy or gal, right? And ooh, you're great stuff. Ooh, then you often you tend to go deeper, and that's the most enlightening interviews you do. You see the distinction? Yes. So apparently I picked up on it already back in the day. I just never thought about it until you made me aware now. I never thought about it until you just mentioned it. Yeah, but it's been it's been like uh, a, a deliberate cultivation of the entertainment aspect of the alti stuff. That's what uh, Netflix can afford, right? Yes. But they can't go all the way. It's, it's back to the boundary. A certain amount have spilled over into the exoteric field of the normies, the muggles, right? The exotericians, mm. the sleepwalkers. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. now you can you can kind of deal with it. Like UFOs. Now you can do a UFO thing and be taken seriously. So mm -hmm. it's like the overtone windows is, is being stretched bigger and bigger. But at the same time, we have this force. We have this force at the same time, a simultaneous force. And this force is not natural because I believe the first one is the trend of opening up the paradigm shutters. It's a trend. But then you have the artificial force doing cancel culture. Uh, identity politics, um, censorship. Now I have to have a show in 2022 called The Case for Freedom. Yeah, I yeah. never saw that coming when I started back in 15. That I have to convince people that freedom is a thing? Oh, yeah. That's the result of the other force that's working in parallel. It's like both forces are getting stronger at the same time. There's the, there's the go into your silo, go into your bubble and don't even dare peeking out of it and at the same time oh nothing there's no taboos anymore we can discuss anything with anyone yes so it's so weird that both of those are there at the same time fuck that if anything proves the simulation theory that's it <laughs> <laughs> al you're awesome but you know mm -hmm. it's the knuckle draggers right so mm -hmm. the, this is 
the, you are not going to, this is the slow, hard truth that I've come to, is no, the knuckle draggers are quite happy being knuckle draggers, and they're actually quite proud of being knuckle draggers. Mm -hmm. And the dilemma that we really face that you don't want to talk about, mm -hmm. and I don't want to talk about, is they are as much an obstacle as they are a force for the positive change we want to see in the world. So when you talk about the people being woken up, well, what are they waking up right. to? They're waking up to their own crazy version of reality. Mm. And I think that there's a there's the kind of shoehorn effect here where the two extreme ends of the of what seem to be the polar opposites, the further you go, they start yeah. coming together. Yeah. So we start coming together with the crazy Satanists, the crazy elitists, the crazy mm. Luciferians who say, as I said in last year's show, what the hell do you want to be in the soup with those people for? Mm. Those idiots. This is the French Revolution all over again, mm. right? This mm. is not the American Revolution. This is the French Revolution, mm. where this is uh, this is the killing fields in Cambodia. Let's mm. take anyone who's intellectual, who thinks, who wears eyeglasses, let's take them out and kill them, right? <laughs> so that, yeah. that has always been at risk. Right. And so we, we turn around and we say, who are our real allies in this? Mm -hmm. And when we start looking and they start looking more and more like elitists who say, yeah, we don't really, no, we don't really want those people around. Those people are not helping. Uh, but I have a solution for that problem. Okay. Yeah, I have a solution for that. I, I, I see where you're taking it. It's a very great point you're raising. I'm glad you're taking it up because I've noticed a tendency in you that you kind of expect all the different people you talk with to come together on all the different issues, illusions that are crumbling. And I, I've always thought you expect too much of people. Uh, the, the real uh, journey up the mountain is for yourself, not for the collective. The best we can hope for right on. for the collective is for them to... Because, look, I have to go back a step before I get to the punchline. You know as well as me, We've discussed this before, that almost everyone in the world today realizes that something is rotten in the state of Denmark, but they realize it within their own narrow silo, and they don't transfer it to everything else. They think everything else is working smoothly because they're not an expert in that field. I'll give you a short example. I have in my family a geologist. He's retired now, a professor. He's been fighting the climate change now. Oh, talk about synchronicity. This lady that you uh, showed to Bernardo Castro, I just discovered her a few days ago. This uh, climatologist, Dr. Judy something. So that was funny to see Dr. You. Judith Curry. Yeah, you brought her up in your show with uh, Castro that I loved. Anyway, back to point. So he's realized this for this long, but he doesn't realize that this is the same collapse of checks and balances within the field of medicine. So he believes the vaccine thing. His father was a doctor. He, he He's oblivious of that, but he knows it's rotten and corrupted and he's fighting in the climate change area. You see, this is how everyone is functioning. And I, I think most people don't have the strength to even entertain that you know, the whole paradigm needs to uh, change. But anyway, back to my point. I said I had a... No, no, that, that, but that's such a great point. I just have to... That's such an awesome, awesome point. And we've all experienced that, where someone wakes up to part of it and then remains yeah. kind of totally entrenched in the rest. So go ahead. And then you poke them and try to force them. Like you did it with Bernardo too. Obviously, he wasn't ready for, for some hard truth in, in one field because he hasn't paid attention to it. Oh, he can talk like a master on the thing that you usually have him on for, that you cheer on. But then you see what happens when you try to push him into another water. He becomes a human being like everyone else. Now, these are the knuckle draggers you are criticizing. So how to handle it? Ron Paul had a solution long ago. In fact, even before him, Leon Trotsky had the exact same solution. It doesn't matter where you're coming from. And they all said, and not just those two, but they are two very different examples who realized one single truth that we all have in common. And that is never about... Um, it's never about 
getting the majority. It's never about getting everyone enlightened, everyone to see the illusion, everyone to agree upon the so- solutions to the illusion. It's always been about coalitions. That's how the human collective mind moves forward. If enough people are against the vaccine, I don't care. You can be a Nazi, a Christian fundamentalist. You can be a virus denier. Come into my camp. Come in, uh, into my tent. Okay. There's room here. We fight this fight and we win. Bam. Okay, what's the next fight? Is the next fight uh, whether UFOs, uh, whether we have free energy, anti-gravity. Come into my tent whoever it is, because that way, this is real democracy, Alex, is better than any democracy that's been designed by any system, because usually those democracies become the dictatorship of the majority. This mechanism that everybody comes together and pushes in the same direction for this specific issue brings us forward. There will be morons in our tent on this specific issue, and they will lose other battles where we may be against them because then we're fighting that battle. But for this specific issue, let's come together. And I sincerely believe that the uh, majority will always go in the right direction in this situation, given that we are not too manipulated, given that there's a minimum of free speech and open information. This is why they need to control the information. This explains two things. Of course, it goes without saying that they control media and why. We don't even have to discuss that. Everybody knows, everybody agrees. But that's just one coin of the control game. The other one is to keep us in fighting. We have to blame our neighbor. We can't, uh, you know, mention any of the entities in the uh, uh, controlling mechanism. That's where we just make down. So how to do that? Cancel culture. Amp up the cultural war so people care more about abortion or gender or what have you, all sorts of insane things, so that we don't come together on the important things that has to do with the economy or our or the control, you know, the the passport, the the social credit system, all that stuff. No, divide and conquer is the game. So I can't get on people because they look at my curriculum and they're very comfortable if they only saw the other guests I had on for their area. But then they see guests for other area. They don't know the guests. They don't even understand the area. They think it's some kind of lunatic show going on here. And I can't get that guest on because I'm not only focusing on baseball. I have the audacity to focus on all the sports, yeah. right? And so I have to try to dance around, tap dance around to get them on. What? Why am I mentioning this? It's directly connected to this grand reality of our modern zeitgeist, which is divide and conquer. You can't talk to your neighbor. You have to blame your neighbor. Just don't blame Fauci or anyone in the top. Politicize everything. Everything becomes about teams. Everything, oh, you're in the wrong team, bam, cancel. This is the opposite of science. And this is how science has been hijacked. So when you say we don't believe in science anymore, I disagree. We don't believe in institutionalized science or scientists there. You know, the politicization and commercialization of science. But I do believe in the process. And that process says you can share bad with anyone. Any for any reason, like in the old days, remember they said any uh, advertisement is good advertisement. Bam, completely out of the window today. Okay, I'll stop my rant now. Are you following me? I'm following you. I'm just, I, I, I resonate more with the conversation we had last year because we covered a lot of the same ground. And at some point, you had done a spectacular interview on some audacious title like the hidden secrets of everything or something like that is about <laughs> yeah is about an, an esoteric uh, occulted understanding of death you know mm. and you really were quite impassioned in talking about uh, how much knowledge there really is that has been carefully preserved through systems of, of through wisdom traditions about death right, and then we talked right. about that in contrast to modern after death science, like after death communication or near death experience or shared death experience. But the, the, the key central point that I think we both came to is that the vastness of this experience, which we don't even understand this experience, this, we understand that this, this experience of 
being human, like you and I talking right now, we understand that that's a tiny, tiny little drop in this ocean of my soul, yeah. of my of my soul. Yeah. I was going to say consciousness, but that that's too grand. Just in my soul's journey, yeah. this is tiny, tiny, tiny. So that's the problem, I guess, I have with the big tent uh, coalition kind of thing. No. Yeah, but everything is relative. Ho hold on. Yeah. Hunger only for truth, hunger only for justice, mm -hmm. only for truth, only for justice, no compromise. If you believe, if you're a Christian, no, you need to go back and understand right, right, the, right. the fallacy of the historical Jesus narrative. If mm. you're a Muslim, even worse. Mm. If you're a, a Judy, if you believe in Judaism, then you've missed the whole point of the first two points of the thing. Mm. No, we do not need to tolerate other people's silliness. We should not suffer fools gladly. No, right. we should okay. not respect other people's belief. Hunger only for truth, but hunger only for justice and love. Because in the end, we're just tiny little drops in, in our soul's journey. Got you. Yeah, I want to comment upon this. Okay, I'm glad you kind of restared us back to that sub point of yours, because yeah, it's a valid point. But the irony here. You, you, you come off as an activist on this, you really a truth uh, warrior, and uh, you've always been. But here's where our kind of cultural thing is different, because I, I come from Esoterica. That's like, we've already thrown in the towel and said, we give up. We can't make everyone aware. We, we just, we just, the default is everybody's sleeping and now I'm going to try to wake up as much as I can. And if I meet others on my journey who also seek that or has some ability to do that or has shown to do that to some extent, I'm going to hitch my wagon to that person as long as that's useful for both of us. And so this brings the age old philosophical problem of uh, what is the function? And I, I, I discussed this briefly also with his work. What is the function of our reality? And to me, it seems like the function of reality is changing right now, like they're changing the, <laughs> the goal of the simulation game we're in. But if the function is that we're, we're some kind of school, right, then your problem is really that in, your parents, instead of putting you in an elite school where people are functioning at your level, you're being put in a school with a Norwegian school. In the Norwegian school, we put morons and geniuses in the same. That's the whole philosophy of our country, that uh, it benefits both of them to be in the same class. But then you're going to be annoyed by all these morons who still hasn't even figured out how to come. That happened with me. My grandfather taught me when I was four years old to read and write and count. Cool. And so when I came in the first class in school, uh, I was super bored. I couldn't pay attention. And we don't have like, oh, uh, the morons in one class and the elites in another. So the teacher gave me books for the sixth degree level. So I was sitting in the behind reading those books, being very bored. And that developed uh, a sabotage for me, namely that I never did homework. I never, why should I do homework? I already know all this stuff. So that became a bad habit. So everyone caught up with me by the time we came to the six, de <laughs> six degree class. And that's what's happening with you. You're complaining of, of, yeah, but don't you see if you can realize it? You have to eat a bit. <laughs> Alex, my default view is that that's impossible. Yes. You, you look if you can get even 10% to that level. But my point with the coalition uh, uh, method is that we don't need 50% uh, enlightenment on any matter. We can get you know, uh, a critical mass, maybe as low as 10%. And then a revolution comes about, a French revolution comes about just by 10%. And because we now have forced with our will, our collective will, a new normal, that new normal will stimulate the morons easier to wake up to higher realities, high, uh, other important uh, areas where they have to shift the paradigm. Because now society is a little better on this small issue that we changed, so now we're stimulating people instead of pushing them down, because that's really what the fight is about. It's about creating collective tools to keep us down or dumb us down or make a devolution versus creating collective tools to raise us, stimulate us, inspire us, to, to better us. 
that's uh, at one level a battle that has gone on for a long time too. And I'm sure many of those who actually introduces solutions that aren't solutions, they are at best detours and distractions, but more likely they are sabotaging mechanisms. Many of those have this same glimmer in their eye as you when you talk about this. You're a truth seeker. You want a better mental for Many of them too, but they're just incredibly misguided. And so in many levels, it's also a battle of ideas. It's always a battle of ideas at the same time as it's a battle of specific issues. So I agree with you for the battle of ideas, but it's something about you have to choose your battles too if you want to win the war. And you can't expect the entire battalion to join you on every single battle you, you want to go into. Better you find willing soldiers where you need them, and that way you will win the war, even if it's not the same brothers in arms in every battle. You understand what I mean? I understand. Let me bring it down to a real personal okay. example, mm -hmm. small one that I think everyone can relate to. We have a dog. I want to send you a picture of the dog. Mm -hmm. It's this huge, this huge 150 pound dog that somebody couldn't take care of anymore. And my wife, who we fostered like 50 dogs, Wonderful. 60 at this point. Oh, wow. So, so Freddie, and now is always the case the dog comes in as my wife's dog and winds up being the dog that i have to walk and take care of yeah, of course i'm walking back from the beach with the dog and i'm i'm walk up to my neighbor who is a big dog person and she's super nice and um, where's the picture i can't see it i want to see it while you talk about it i mean let me pull it up or him or her him is it a bitch him him Okay, yeah. I just love an excuse to say that word. <laughs> <laughs> Political correct Norway, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. Here, yeah. let's get it. Uh, let's get the. Oh, look, it's there. There we are at Thanksgiving. There's a yeah. running. Oh. Uh, here's Freddie, but you can't. <laughs> look at. Oh wow! There's there's Freddie. Can you I see can't him? make out the even the race. He's huge. He's huge. Here, let's give you a better picture of him. Uh, Oh, here he is with the whole fam. Oh, he's a Saint Bernard? He looks like it. He's actually a um, a Mastiff. Oh, okay. But you can see how huge he is, right? Yeah, kind of. Huge, yeah. Yeah. huge dog. So walking back, I walk past, I see my neighbor and I'm going to walk up and just chat with my neighbor. I don't know how, but the term, the name Fauci came up. And she goes, oh, 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 I, I, I love that guy. Right, <laughs> it's right, probably nine right. months ago, you know, right in the heart of it. So California. Now, right, when you hear that, you can <laughs> you can react in a number of different ways. Yeah. But I have a hard time not reacting at yeah. a real visceral level. But I've managed to maintain that to a certain extent. Mm. And I go, but Carol, I mean, have you looked at all into any of the stuff on him? I, I no, I like him. I just I just think he's a good guy. What about gain of function? I said, do you know what gain of function is? No, I just, no, I, I just, I like him. Give her a Robert um, Kennedy's book for Christmas, okay? <laughs> Be a good neighbor. Yeah. It's called the real Anthony Fauci, shout out. Shout out. Mm. Here's my question. Like, we all get that. But what do we do with it? Because... Oh, what do we do with that at that other spiritual level? Because she is a good person. She has a good heart. I've known her for decades. Mm. And I, I have deep feelings of affection for her. We live in the same turf, on the same dirt, you know? Yeah. And so how are we supposed to hold those people in our lives? I'm torn because mm. she's clearly completely moronic about uh fauci she just have she just have wrong information people make decisions no no she has no no she has no interest in that's my point that's the knuckle dragger that's yeah. what i thought see i thought richard cox if i really spent the time and explain to him how ridiculous mm. no virus is, how mm. there's hundreds and thousands of journals and journal papers on virology that have been peer reviewed and the, sh can only exist inside of a world, like you said, a bracketed reality where there's some basic truth fundamentally to viruses. And there may be a lot of non-truth, but I mean, basically it's not a no virus world. Mm. 
that is just that is e- equivalent right mm. so wh- how do we how do we live in that world how do we go forward and this is like a, a this is like a deep question for me. It's a question yeah, I really yeah, think about. Yeah, How yeah. do I want to be in the world? What do I want to do? And that's why I said I pause skeptico. I'm not sure how to go forward, but I'm sure that the way I have been going at it is not going to serve me because Skeptico's always been about my journey shared. You know, mm. it's really just about my journey. And the trick is I put it out there and share it so that I can talk to a wider number of people, but it's really just my journey and it's mm. still my journey. Mm. I'm not sure my journey is served by doing it the way that I've done it because of Richard Cox, because of Carol next door, because of the knuckle draggers in the world who really don't really just want to be kind of left alone. <laughs> they don't, mm. they really don't want the truth. No, no. The truth hasn't been, you know, you should really, uh, the way forward for you is to make a time machine and go back to ancient Egypt because there, that's the lost culture that had, uh, we have enjoyment. Our current side guest, enjoyment is on top of everyone. If everybody want to be honest with themselves, maximum enjoyment. That wasn't the collective paradigm of the ancients. For them, it was wisdom. That was the highest virtue, insight the ability to understand as much as possible. That's why when we look back, we don't understand what anything they were on about. Uh, the best we can do is to interpret it literally and thinking they were knuckle draggers because we are knuckle draggers, so we project. But no, it's a serious uh, issue. Uh, and I'm glad you used the neighbor problem. I don't have a clear answer for you for once um, because now you're entering into the domain of the individual. You have to make an individual assessment, like in your shoes, what would I do? It depends on what I knew about her, but I would have, I would need an inkling of interest from her to even bother pushing anything at all. I may just do a uh, like obscure question. Well, are you so sure about him? Well, what if there's a shadow side, blah, blah. something, you know, just to put in a seed, but you cannot convert someone who do, who is not interested, who is not seeking to shift their paradigm. That's our problem. Usually the best way to do it, because I've been researching this for years and years through my work, through my other stuff, and that's that you start changing the information they get, and then you see what kind of person they are based on that new information they now have access to. Some will start questioning or, or, or seek elsewhere. Others will maybe just wholesale reject it because it's too much, because they realize it will become, a, for them, a painful paradigm shift. Yes. Others will try to maybe bend backwards to make it fit. But people have very different reactions. And you can only take, let, let, let's reduce this to sales. This is how I trained my salespeople back in the day. I said, first of all, you can't sell anything you don't, you're not convinced of. You have to believe in the product. That's going to make you a real seller because if nothing else, the intuition of the buyer will bust you. Uh, you can have all the right information, all the right facts. You're conveying it without conviction. Uh, there's something uh, dissonating in your message. So you have to make, you have to believe in it yourself. That's number one. Then number two, they w- need to either be displeased with the current type of item there uh, this is representing or at least be open for that there's possible to surpass it if they're very in love with the item they already have you can't sell to them even if they uh, needed uh, even if you're selling ice and you're in sahara so it's it's all about the other person and collectively forget about it this is why i'm going back to the coalition because you can always do the fight for the right thing there and then with those who have woken up to that thing there and then. But you can't expect everyone to wake up to everything or even wanting to do it because we live in a reality where uh, most of us are still trying to learn the letters and read. Whereas we just look if enough of us are ahead of that game so we can do something different, which is what we do. I'm just appreciating any time I meet a person. I don't think there's one other person in the world who would agree with me about everything if we had enough time and resources to really, you know, 
take that battle down. I know some people do the mistake of discovering someone that understands them very well and they understand them and then they, oh, we're soulmates, ah, everything. But the thing is, you may have a good chemistry for communication and you may have some common values, but there's always going to be discrepancy and you may not even have a better life with this person just because you agree about certain things. In fact, it should be more on the personal level you agree uh, and the existential level to, you know, really feel as an existential harmony. Mm. So this is the best I can do. Uh, I've given up long ago thinking that the, I'm just amazed that we can do as much as we do today. You just compare us to 10 years ago, 50 years ago, 100 years ago. There's never been more awakened people than now, Alex. You see, saying the glass is half empty. I'm saying it's actually half full because I'm coming from a much more nihilistic and pessimistic outlook on the collective than you are doing. You think this battle for truth is actually at some level it's welcome and it can actually change anything. Again, people have to want change. They have to be ready for change. This is why a certain maturity among the souls are needed for us to take anything up to a next level. And and how do we even know? Look, we may be artificially stifled. You sent me the uh, link to Greer, and he's arguing that we've been kept down artificially. Maybe if someone like Greer were put in, in charge of everything and uh, could just dictate how stuff should be. So, And let's say he did it right so that we were stimulated on every single area. I think we could double or maybe triple the level of society function zone. But there would still be rapists. There would still be, you know, knuckle draggers. There would still be people who, who's not on board with, you know, going forward. That's just how, how our class, that's the level we're functioning on, man. That's all I can say. So Okay, that's good. When it comes to where you're going to take skeptical, you, you should consider then, do you want to make a maximum impact? than fewer people. Do you want to go for quantity? Do you want to awake maximum people, number of people? Then you have to amp down, you know, the quality. I, I don't think you can do both the maximum awakening and a majority at the same time. Sorry. So I, I think you got some interesting points because we're dancing around some of the, the fundamental issues that uh, I always bring us back to. Because yeah. I love your occultist perspective, which you gave us earlier in the show, which needs to be fully, I think, spelled out and appreciated. And I don't want to misrepresent it. So at any time, jump in there and tell sure. me. But what I heard you say earlier in the show is that, look, people who understand that there is this esoteric occulted, hidden knowledge, have learned that there's a certain practical system for perpetuating that knowledge going forward. And yeah. one aspect of it is that you, you, you don't give it out to everybody. And when you do give it out, you're kind of careful and you yeah. kind of, you know, it's not yeah. for everyone. No, not everyone's ready for it. Go with the simple story first. I like how you connected that to sales because I think that is the sales, uh, the, the sales value system, which is it's the example I always use. I have a lot of experience in sales and sales training as well. And, you know, Jordan Belfort, people might remember from The Wolf of Wall Street, the famous movie. Mm. And he's a sales trainer and he's written a number of books. And as you were going through your experience with training salespeople, I was thinking of Jordan Belfort. And that's one of his things is like, hey, if you know, he what I love about him is it's very black and white in terms of the decision tree you go through. And he goes, okay, if you get to this point and they say no, move on. You're not gonna sell that person. Now, this person, da, 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 da. but the point of Jordan Belfort is no one can read that and say that's not black magic. Mm. It is. It is. It's mind control. Yep. It's say this, repeat this couch it this way and you can manipulate this person into doing what you want and if they fall into this category then you're going to be less statistically likely to manipulate them in the way that you want so move on to your next call so the intersection this, this relates back this is why occultism gets a bad name right mm -hmm. because you are learning 
in the process of learning how to perpetuate truth, you're also learning how to subvert, how to uh, uh, dominate, how to, you know, yeah. do all the, the bad stuff that you sent me in the latest thing of the latest pedophile elite kind of thing that comes mm -hmm. up all the time. It's like, why the hell not? I have the power. How do I know I have the power if I don't exercise the power in some way? So this, I think, as we return to again and again in our discussion here, is the fundamental core issue is how do we walk this line? How do we walk this path of being a truth warrior, being a light warrior? May, may the okay. truth that is in your heart, the virtuous truth that's in your heart, how can that always come forward from that perspective, right? Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, I have one idea. I just want to say about the sales. These are the yeah. These are the black magicians in sales. We know them, and uh, they would say you don't have to believe in the product. Just use the right manipulation tools. Now, there's also a white magic principle in sales, and that's the believe in the product thing. But at the end of the line, that's not how you really spread. Uh, something it's the trend versus the fashion fashion is imposed upon us if you uh, own all the control mechanisms of information so you have a uh, your multinational corporation sure you can day in and day out bombard us with advertisement and yes it will work to a certain extent but then they look with horror and envy on real movements of trends where it comes from the bottom for example um uh, yeah, something that's been, like how Beatles became popular to take something trivial or, you know, Polo Coelho, he didn't have much marketing for his book, The Alchemist, but it just went, or, or Harry Potter, right? Nobody could predict it. It just happened. This is the best way. This is the white way. It's the natural way. And that's why I said to my uh, salespeople, you have to believe in it. Now, if you look at how ideas spread, we have a very erratic, I would say, even a, a sick. Uh, aspect in our culture, and that comes from the monotheistic religions, uh, especially Christendom and Islam, because they have been using uh, preaching, converting people. And you would think that's effective because they are the largest religions. And then you look at the Masons who say, no, 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 you can't join us. Huh? You think you can join us? Well, maybe if you hope through this an obstacle and this and that, but this bullshit, because uh, if you know anything about Masons, you know you can join them if you really know how it works. <laughs> but the sales pitch is different and it's much better. And it's the old, it goes back to the old thing, I don't want to belong to a club that wants me. Now let's rewind to the religions. I said that the conversion religions, the preaching religions, they didn't become big by preaching. That's a misnomer. How they really became big was with force. It was by the sword in both cases. And as soon as they were big, right. then they could continue their campaign with this preaching thing. And this get closer in because humans, most humans are habitual. So before Christendom came, they were habitual of the old religions. They weren't enlightened, even if their religions were enlightened. And it's the same today. We are habitual. So if they can force a new paradigm on us, we will, to a certain extent, move along with it. But that's why I think the battle now is between those who find artificial means to try to influence everyone on the earth at the same time. It goes back to what I said uh, two season reviews ago when I said that, wow, it's a game, computer game. For the first time, the whole of the world is swallowed up in it. Well, with that comes also the information war, right? So for the first time, they may not influence Chinese people, uh, the Western oligarchs may not, in terms of how they would think politically, but they can influence us by, for example, um, you know, the mask reality may be a global thing. It's cracking now, of course, the vaccine reality. So there's certain things they can make us believe. And it's still black magic because essential in black magic is scarcity and fear. Scarcity and fear, not inspiration and uh, truth and that's really the path you are on in so how can you continue that path where you're using where you're trying to appeal to the better nature of people where they want to know the truth hope that they're not too scared not too scarcity uh you know withdrawn into their own little bubble 
How can you entice them to come up? I'm doing the same. And for me, I'm coining it as paradigm shifts because people want to believe that they want to expand their worldview. People want to believe, maybe it's a uh, what we call a life lie, but theoretically they think they're interested in truth. So I carefully introduce one piece here, one piece there, one piece here, one piece there. And if you listen to enough shows, eventually many of those dots are going to come together without them intending it. And that helps them to want to get to the really bigger picture. But I'm, I'm very conscientious of the fact that uh, someone comes in for the Oak Island mystery and they don't care about the show we did about uh, scientism, for example. But as they fall in love with the show, and this is why your show also has an important mission, as they fall in love with it, they start exploring other areas where I'm poking. And the same is happening in your show, but in a different way. You're more on a monolith journey, but you go by area by area in seasons, in like... I, I, I flirt with it, you know, within the same season, 10 different things. You're also going through those 10 different things, but you're doing it in a longer ride, so to speak. So those you have still with you are still sharing that new level. And you would have to assume they would get it. Otherwise, they wouldn't keep riding with you. And then you pick up new people and they may like I did, go back and see, okay, where were you before? That's interesting. That's a very interesting experience to see, okay, so this came before this. And I'm with you there too. Otherwise, I wouldn't meet you at where you are now. So I don't think the way you're doing it is, I don't understand why you have to revisit that entire way because it's working. At some level, it's working. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, let me say one more thing. Okay. Esoterica. Yeah, one important reason we try to keep it among our own is precisely that it shouldn't fall in the hands of people like the deep state, right? Because they, you can be sure that they will do anything they can with this to try to make it something negative. How can I use this thing to oppress, to dumb down, to keep them back? That's why you have a responsibility when you know something that is good, that works, share with with it with as many you know let's say it's like jesus said better to learn people to fish than to give them fish i totally agree but when people are not interested in learning how to fish when they are just too incompetent let's say they don't have legs and arms then you have to keep giving them fish so you need to know how exclusive is this fishing technique you're exploring you want to be let anyone be able to get a whale? Well, then it's going to be 10 people in your audience, man. But you want to get, let them get any type of creature in the ocean? Well, then you can expand it to 100 million people. You see what I mean? You have to find that balance between quantity and quality. That's what Esoterica is all about. Okay, with that, I'm going to play one more clip. Okay. And then I want to hear what you have to say, and then we can move towards... Predictions. Adjourning. Okay. Adj predictions. <laughs> yes. <laughs> predictions and then adjourning. Okay. So here is a, a, a clip from the show that we've mentioned a couple times on my ah, interview with love that show. Bernardo Castro. Yeah. Let me go ahead and play it and then we'll see what you think. On this episode of Skeptico, a show about rules. When to break them? Still hanging out at the after party and uh, with me, uh... Tupac Shakur. All right. Believe in Death Row East. <laughs> believe in that. For real. Home, That's boy, it. Right I'm a but if you believe in God, believe in Death Row East. And when to follow them. I accept the rules, you know? It, laboratory evidence? Fine. That's all I will look at. Reasoning? Fine. That's all I will base my argument on. I will never appeal to my own personal subjective insight and you go a long way, it's enough to win. After this transition has been accepted, then we can review the rules of the game. That first clip was from 1996, Tupac Shakur, who I included because he was kind of for breaking rules and famously said, play the game, but don't let the game play you. And the second was from our excellent, excellent guest, Dr. Bernardo Castrop, who has been on the show before, I highly respect, is truly one of the leaders in paradigm change from biological robot meaningless universe to wherever we go next. Now, the rules game thing really has a lot of different meanings as this interview goes on. 
I would just interject that, yes, it does, because as you pointed out, I grilled Bernardo pretty hard in terms of his uh, going down the path of the uh, Netherlands global climate change. Like I always say, I had a guy, Nova Scotia, global climate change. Everyone sees climate change on a global basis based on what the world looks like out of their, out of their window. But yeah. the point I was really making, I can kind of get off topic is Tupac way back in the day play the game don't let the game play you and that's what it's mm. about for me too no I'm going to play the game I'm not going to let the game play me I'm about my journey I don't care if I have an audience it's truth be told I never did care um, so no. it, it doesn't matter and if it all goes away then it just keeps going on. Nothing changes. And that's a good reason why I did stop because I didn't say I completely quit, but I've stopped because until you stop, you can't really talk about stopping. <laughs> you have to stop in order to say, this is what it's like to back yeah. off. This is what it's like to stop playing the game. Is anyone listening? If anyone wants me to go forward, I'll figure out whether that makes sense. But if no one's calling my name, then I can just stay on the bench. That's fine too. <laughs> Man, are you turning our commemoration into an epitaph? Oh Jeez. my gosh. I didn't know it was this serious. Look, you had a lot of people coming on your show to to applaud your project. So uh, it shouldn't be dependent on re response. But if it is, uh, that should be your cue. But no, I think you will, the deeper you go, the smaller the audience you will cater to is. But on the other side, the more they will follow your absolute uh, boundary or should I say horizon. You understand? That's how it works. Uh -huh. Like, uh, you know, I'm involved uh, um, in like a spiritual group, so to speak. Call it what you want, a mystery school, a gathering of equal uh, kindred spirits. And we are deliberately few. We can never become a mass movement. It's against the entire thing. And it's much better, you know, the spiritual... Uh, What's it called? Thrust gets fatigued in huge uh, gatherings, like a football stadium. It's very limited what you can achieve there. I mean, if you can get everyone to focus on a basic emotion, yes, you can manipulate. That's what religions have done, and that's what uh, political go states do. But if you want to raise awareness and the level on a simultaneously on as many as much as possible, then it has to be a small clique. That's how uh, Jesus had 12 disciples, right? He didn't have 12,000 disciples. So uh, some things never change on this level of existence. Nothing is new under the sun. This is one of them. This isn't a new problem, what we're debating now. They debated it in Rome, in Greece, probably in Egypt, you name it, India. So it's just the means are different. We're talking now transmission of information via the ether, right? So I, I don't have an answer for you. Uh, I acknowledge your good questions, but I recognize that these questions, and that may you may find some comfort in that, that these are age-old questions and there are solutions. Of course, where there are people have been before, there are always solutions, but you have to find the one that's right for you. And uh, that really depends. Enjoy this time out. Assess very importantly what you really want to achieve. I think that's the most important thing. And then the rest will, will follow if you see what I mean. I, I, I do. I really appreciate your whole, all, all the, everything you're saying. I especially appreciate the first part of what you're saying, because I think there's some really deep insights there in terms of how that? the energy works, how the energy works in a small number of people mm. versus how it works in a larger number of people mm. and whether we should seek this kind of crowd push, push, which is always the draw, or whether we should reduce. And the, the one thing I, I marry that to with what I said is you, you can't, you, you have to pause. You have to, I think, I have to pause. I have to step back 
in order to go forward. I can't continue to do things the way that I've done them and then say, oh, this is now, uh, this is now different. And I think it's, it's just a natural part of the growth process. The other thing I think is a natural part of the growth process that I want to tap into going forward is I want to be more connected to truly the spiritual path of truth, of justice, of not being, you know, the, the, I, look, I'm all about knowing as much as I can. Um, but this isn't, this knowing isn't a competition. So the knuckle draggers are not my enemy. They're just kind of in my way. I have to kind of move, <laughs> yeah. move my shopping cart around them. But I don't have to get hung up on that. And I think I do sometimes or, or, or I think in the same way, I always kind of thought the disinformation, misinformation, co-intel agents need to be exposed so people can see what they're doing. Maybe not so much. Maybe what I need to do, maybe what we need to do, because when I say we, you know, last time we spoke, I talked about. I felt a need to bring truth to the truth community, to the yeah. alt media community, that they're kind of going off the rails. Well, in the last year, they've gone further off the rails. It's, <laughs> it's just insane. It's stupid. It's just uh, suffer fools gladly. It's just one foolish idea after another. It's gone from flat earth to uh, heliocentric, uh, you know, kind of uh, whatever the opposite of heliocentric is, you know, so it's like, <laughs> and these ideas have to be presented, it, it has a wokeness to it, you know, these ideas have to be presented on an equal basis. Maybe that's true. We really can't plant our flag mm -hmm. in the ground. Maybe the uh, sun really does revolve around the earth. Let's talk about that seriously. No, we really don't need to talk about it seriously. But what we maybe don't need to do also is kind of spend a lot of time worrying about why people are going there. And maybe we need to find a connection back to the heart, the love, the yeah, coalition. light that's in us. Yeah, yeah. It's, well, it's the coalition, but in your coalition, you wanted the big tent, right? This is the big yeah. tent, small tent thing. Depending on the case, of course. But you, you, you're complaining about the fragmentation of of the counterculture, which is real. It's true. Which is uh, the only thing that can can uh, help it is the coalition thinking. But when it comes to surfer fools gladly, well, I mean, when in Rome, right? Um, Everything will become a battle, man. You'll 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 end up alone. The end is nigh. You will uh, carry those signs down the street. Nobody will listen. The more you push on someone who's not ready, the more they will retreat. This is why the Masons are brilliant. They are saying, "No, we got something exclusive going here. Uh, you have to come to us and knock." And uh, maybe that's what what the rationale of the skeptics. Remember, we discussed this back in the day. Why are they retreating? Why are they now creating their own places for discussion? But nobody, but not discussing with anyone outside. Maybe because they want to radiate an exclusiveness. Everybody knows about them now, and they know where to find them. And now let's make some fun in our own house. Let's have a party in our own house so people want to come and join our party. Maybe some kind of strategy like this because we know. Yes, they have, I love this. Yeah, because they have good strategists. I right? love this. Yeah, but we can do the same. Yes, um, uh, that's, what's, that's what's emerging right now. I'm not saying I'm going in this direction. <laughs> but hey, hey, that's the maybe that's Skeptico 3.0 is it's a private club with a small membership. Please unsubscribe. <laughs> Either that or it's a huge club, but we have like 10 different parties going on in the same time. No, yeah, well, no, that's my, that's my no. house. <laughs> come in, come in. And if you want to, if you, okay, I just like techno party. I don't like a classical concert. Well, okay, fine. But here the door is open. You want to come in? Well, I like Al as a conductor. I see he can be a DJ there and can be a conductor in the symphony. Let me peek in the symphony room and see what's going on. And then, oh, I'm enthralled. I didn't know I even enjoyed this. I'm sitting down and checking it out. Or this is not for me. I'm retreating back to the techno party. This is how people are. You can't expect anything less. And uh, I, for one, I, I kind of choose. It's interesting if you choose each each uh, method then, because we can assess and evaluate. Uh, every year we hook up, right? <laughs> yeah, you got it. How does it work for you? I think in the inspiration model, I think that if stuff was 
pedagogically angled to everyone. I think many of these knuckle draggers, if they realized there was a real option to dragging knuckles, they would maybe take that option because everybody has inside them, as you started out this show to declare, everybody has this longing. We are all part of the same. Uh, We're all of the light. So even the hardest sleeper can be woken. But yeah, we have to, again, when in Rome, we have to tailor it to the individual. They all need different angles into the awakening. And if you push it, you're going to scare them away. Bernardo Castro, who you tortured with your climate uh, gate uh, approach. I mean, you know you could have him on and on and on for other uh, subject that day, and he would be a never-ending resource. But if he retreats and recoils and becomes skeptical because you push an I- issue, a button he's, he's not ready to, and I'm not, don't, I don't mean to like hang him out to dry here. This goes for all of us. No, because he doesn't. He, he he does not. He is, you know, our conversation was very engaging and he was yeah. in it yeah. to the beginning. He handled it like a man. He did. And he handled it like, yeah. not only, yeah, like, hey, you want to go? Throw down. Let's go. I'm, it, I respect the shit out of that. So Look, we have to move on to this. Yeah. Okay. So as we move towards wrapping this up, what uh, what else do you have from Forum Boreal? Yeah, I have a last, yeah, I have a last issue and we can go on because I want to play a clip of my show and get your comment on it. Awesome. This is one of our contention spots, I think, but it doesn't need to be, but if it is, so be it. But I really want to pick your brain on this because we've been dancing around it. I want to play the end of my show called, uh, not UAPs Explained, um, it's called Portal of High Strangeness. Now, let's see if I can share with you. Any culture will tend to interpret any new phenomenon in terms of its own technology. Had this all occurred in the uh, Middle Ages, it would have been given a totally different interpretation, it would have been a religious interpretation. We've entered the space age, therefore it is very logical for a new phenomenon of this sort to be interpreted in, the, in terms of our own advanced technology. Um, it's also complicated by the fact that astronomy has arrived at the point, we know enough now about the evolution of stars, to make it extremely likely that uh, there are many other intelligences in the universe. But there, I think we have to follow Arthur C. Clarke in pointing out that we take perhaps a much too narrow view of what intelligence in in, in the universe may be. We live on a water planet, it's very logical, therefore, that our, well, our bodies are mostly water. It could be that our consciousness expresses itself through protoplasm and through our particular chemistry. There are bits of information today indicating that, now, for instance, George Wald at Harvard feels that consciousness is the most important factor and that consciousness can exist in many forms. And we are one of those forms. So, hey, as somebody said, the whole question of this trying to communicate with life elsewhere is like the not yet born talking to the long since dead because it takes so long for anything to get. Furthermore, an advanced civilization might regard radio as we regard jungle drums or smoke signals. They may long since have passed the radio stage of, of communication. But still, I think it's important that this program continue because it, it is mm-hmm. It's a, it's an adventure, and it should be done. And it would be philosophically important to find out that there is some intelligence elsewhere. So, my own philosophical feeling about the UFO phenomenon is that when all is said and done, it represents some form of intelligence. But whether that intelligence is from great distances away, or whether it is perhaps much closer to us in a parallel reality or in another dimension, or whether it is in some strange way a product of our own intelligence, our own psyche. I don't know. This is the this is the research problem. That it's in that it seems to be programmed, that it seems to have an intelligence of its own, I think is unmistakable. If anyone who studies the subject just sees that. But the, we must not jump to the conclusion that because it has an intelligence of its own, it is necessarily visitors from outer space. It may, may be in some strange way connected with that intelligence, if that intelligence can in some way project itself down here. Yeah, that's the that's the 
quote I wanted to share with you. This was, of course, Dr. Arlen Hynek. I'm sure you're aware of him. Yeah, it's just super outdated. I mean, it's no longer relevant, but that's okay. Actually, it's not outdated. He was ahead of his time. In there, he gave us... It's, it's, out, it's outdated. It's outdated. You just go to my so? interview with Bernardo Castrop. Like, in, in, Bernardo is, is an embodiment of this kind of thing that you're talking about. You know, he's has to acknowledge UFOs because they're, <laughs> they, they've been made incredibly public. Of course, he's not entitled to his own facts. That's why he has to acknowledge it. Exactly. Yes. And just so people understand what you're saying, that it is now fact that they're so so but then what bernardo still likes to smile and chuckle a little bit at the idea of et hmm. and what the clip i played for bernardo if you remember from that show was i said oh okay great bernardo you now have this uh the really cool foundation that this billionaire from the netherlands has set you up in and uh, sent you and you know you're now able to pursue your own path in terms of consciousness and who's on the board of your directors oh uh let's see here it's um jeffrey kripal from rice university been on the show multiple times let's listen to jeffrey kripal's interview with um oh my god yeah with dr diana walsh pasolka and um whitley streber mm. and let's take note of the fact that jeffrey kripal wrote a book with whitley streber just to remind folks whitley is probably the most well-known abductee alien abductee in history wrote the book communion had the thing on the cover with the alien all the rest of this stuff has been on this show multiple times tells a story of mk ultra uh, abduction the whole thing mm. so now bernardo's kind of in a rock and a tough and a hard place right mm. this Jeff Kripal is on his advisory board of the Essentia Foundation. They're in sync on, on consciousness and all the rest of this. But wait a minute, here he is totally, he's written a book with Whitley Strieber. He's totally on board with the fact that Whitley has had the abduction experience. He has shared the abduction experience with other people who have visited the cabin, right? So Whitley says, hey, these aliens come in and abduct me. And now he has visitors to his house and they go, holy shit, there were aliens in the cabin last night. And he goes, <laughs> yeah, that's what I've been telling you guys. Right. And also in that interview is Dr. Diana Walsh Pasolka, who is religious studies professor in North Carolina and, um, just kind of stumble into the UFO thing. But what does she tell all of us in that interview that I played is that, hey, this is back to the scientific method. The thing that really differentiated my book, American Cosmic, is that I did field research. I was out there with Tyler Durden, pseudonym, yeah. and, uh, and we collected samples, the same that I always remind people the same that Dr. Jacques Vallée, the same kind mm. that Jacques Vallée keeps in his pocket that are unexplainable from a material standpoint. You take our best scientists and you say, how would we manufacture this material here on our planet? And they go, can't do it. We don't know how to do this. Is this organic material? No, this looks like material that was engineered by some highly intelligent because look how it's layered kind of like our little computer mm -hmm. chips. So no. The discussion has moved past. Well, we don't really know uh, what it is, and maybe they're listening to the radio or not. No, uh, it, you, this is again kind of this is what drives people nuts about because I sound so confident, and I, I, I'm not confident. I'm just saying Occam's razor suggests the best evidence suggests that is highly likely that all these traditional cultures throughout time, like the Native American cultures or the cultures in Africa who've said, see those stars up there? That's where they came from. And they came down and told us that's where they came from. And if you look really carefully through your telescopes that aren't advanced enough to see it, you'll see that that star is really a twin star. And then 50 years later, they look and go, oh shit, we didn't have the telescope to say, mm -hmm. but those freaking Africans out there that don't even have a written language, it is a freaking twin star. But they have not so, inherited wisdom. Have you seen uh, Ancient Apocalypse on Netflix with Hancock? Do you get my point? You get my point. Is the discussion... I, has, I've always gotten your point. It's you who doesn't get mine, I think. Well, then, then tell me, because the discussion has moved past. Occam's razor suggests that the most parsimonious answer to the ET question is... 
They come from other freaking planets, and we don't know how they get here. <laughs> and, and we don't know how they cross that barrier. But the burden of proof is on those who, and is there interdimensionality to it? Of course. That, uh, our best guess in terms of how they travel here suggests some kind of interdimensional reality, but it doesn't preclude what we generally experience and understand to be ET is that ET is somehow here is somehow among us has always been among us has been a part of this. That is the most parsimonious explanation for the data at hand and midget Nazis at Roswell is probably not <laughs> the most parsimonious explanation. Okay. Well, uh, I follow you all the way until you come with the conclusion that this is the more, no, and, and you have to back it up. And, and uh, But I agree about we're not entitled to our own facts. And I agree that uh, we have to use Occam's razor now. Then consider the following. First of all, you know who agrees with you? You know who applauds that we should have this uh, alien ET uh, perspective? Just to, This isn't my big argument against it. I'm just making you aware of which tent you just stumble into. That's the CIA's tent. It's the Pentagon's tent. It's Tom DeLonge, who you love his tent. All of these people are saying, no, uh, it's a threat. They These are spaceships. Hold it, but that's, you're mixing You're mixing two things. One is the, the reality. Hollywood agrees with you. No, no, but, but you're, you're, you're conflating two things. One is the reality of the ET presence. And the second is that there's some kind of national security threat that the, the only response is the Pentagon. I mean, the second is, is absurd. Right, right. But the movie, look, it's a both. They've both been pushing the fair element, you know, invasion of the body snatchers or uh, Independence Day. But they also are pushing the little green man on Mars perspective in addition. The movie E.T. is an example. There's many other movies where the aliens aren't the bad guy. So um, latest now is this uh, Avatar thing. So, uh, no, you are in bed, whether you like it or not. At least stand up and admit that and just say, OK, coincidentally, I'm I'm in bed with the bad guys. No, but no, you're misunderstanding. You're misunderstanding the, the understanding of the evidence that suggests that we are in we the haven't discussed the evidence of, yet, but we will. But but it has nothing to do with. I'm just saying who agrees with you. But that doesn't. It doesn't. It, you know, you could guilty by association. Yeah. You know, I mean, yeah. is everyone? No, be suspicious. Everyone of, in Germany who is of a particular a political party are they all neo Nazis just because they? Right. You know, no, it doesn't. No, that's no. not how we. That's not how we do but, things. But that's not my point. That's not my point. I'm saying the big forces, the forces with the money and the decisions are endorsing this paradigm. In fact, they won't. We know from uh, Werner von Braun, who admitted that they're going to make fear of uh, rogue comments. They're going to make fear of nations of concern, terrorism. And the last card will be invasion from space. So there is a paradigm that is backed up, whether it's right or wrong. Maybe it's right. Maybe that's why they admit it. But this paradigm has been backed up from Hollywood, etc. It's it was the first thing, even before the UFO flaps in the, uh, after the war, it was still a belief Al, in ETs. Al, I I gotta jump in there again because I, yep. I I just I feel like you don't really understand the whole playing field on the UFO. I feel like you're kind of we haven't even gotten to the discussion. I'm still well, stuck hold on. on. I think you, I think you're slow. I think you're kind of slow to the party. Okay. The debates I've been having over the last couple of years are mm -hmm. with people like Grant Cameron, who mm -hmm. is very much in the ET camp, but is also in the consciousness camp right. and believes that ET. But these folks are con have somehow pigeonholed themselves into the thing that there can be no bad, that ET is good. Right, this right. is kind of the origin. Stephen Greer. Stephen Greer times 10, which mm. is the, so when those people, you go, okay, what about the evidence of sexual contact, sexual rape mm. between mm. ET? What are we supposed to do with that? Whether we well, take it uh, at the mutilation, but uh, that's not what I want to discuss. No, you're taking well, the let discussion. Me just, let me just make sure. Yep. But here's my point. Mm. You, you could, if you want to pigeonhole me with the Pentagon folks, you could just as easily pigeonhole me with uh, Grant Cameron and Ray Hernandez and the uh, uh, love and light thing. The majority. 
Well, neither one, neither one are. It goes are, back are, to the 30s. That's when people started to believe in little green man on on other planets. This is an you you're talking as if this is some kind of revolution. Maybe you relate to this party, but this party has been going on since before the Second World War. All I'm saying is, before I haven't I haven't even discussed the case yet, but all I'm saying is that the views I'm uh, pointing to as potential more plausible explanations are getting less air by the power. No, that's all. Now, guilty by... You are not guilty. Cameron is a true believer. He's not guilty. But I find it interesting, at least, that the wrong people are endorsing, because these are the same people who also endorsed the uh, air balloon and the uh, swamp gas, because they know a certain segment won't buy the, the explanation that the skeptics will buy, so we need to cater to them too. We throw them a bone, and that's your alien, in my view. Now, let's get to the facts. Jacques Vallée and Richard Dolan have both done a very interesting thing that very few has done in this field, which is the basic you should do. And that's and I asked uh, Dr. Erling Strand that I interviewed, who's a uh, scientist who's uh, investigating this in Norway, has done since the 80s. If you folks shouted for my show, Portal of Strange Highness, it's um, the longest running white public investigation of UAPs in the world. So, and I asked him some of these questions too, and he has done the right calculations because he's an engineer. And Dolan has done does it, and uh, also Valle. And Valle, I read his analysis at the end of my interview with uh, Nick Cook uh, on uh, it was called Pentagon's Biggest Secret. I think you you heard that interview. Did you remember? Yes, and I interviewed, and then I interviewed Nick Cook as a result yeah. of your interview. Yeah. But, but do you remember that I read a quote of Valle at the end there? And this quote is called, it's too many landings. And what Valet does, Dolan has done the same. Very simple math, very simple. You just take account for the facts and you calculate how many landings would there be if we buy into that these are spacecrafts from other planets that coincidentally discovered, often against their will. Maybe it was a crash landing. Maybe they were landing to fix something. Maybe they were landing to whatever and they were just, no. I don't remember the exact number now, but they had to land like millions of times for this to be a real, uh, for what it is. So his only conclusion would be that whatever they are, they are staged. In other words, they are discovered because they want to be discovered. It's an intentional, call it uh, manipulation, whatever it is, it's intentional. That's the only conclusion you can come that I can see from those hard data that they have worked out and be my guest to go through that data and come with a better explanation but that doesn't explain anything it just tells us that they want to that it's staged somehow now you said that i don't agree i don't agree with the assumptions behind that uh calculation, calculation. I, yes no i mean there, there's there's yeah, a lot of just through the numbers yes and there's just a lot of huge assumptions that people are making in terms of what would they be those huge assumptions well one of the you just watched the thing with Stephen Greer, right? In his yeah. CE5 protocol. Do you remember the CE5 protocol? Yeah. It is a conscious, a meditative, right. extended consciousness connection with ET that directs ET into the planet on where to create a sighting. Okay, and that's hard for people to accept. I don't know that I accept it. I'm not saying that it's true. But if you do look at the evidence like of the, the famous Nimitz mm -hmm. Tic Tac, mm -hmm. right? you're on the same page. I interviewed Kevin Day, one of the the guy who was on deck on the ship, looked through the thing, saw the things. One small aspect of that, that a lot of people know, but some people forget is that the fighters are sent up to intercept the Tic Tac ETs out in the ocean, 30 miles outside my window here in San Diego. And they go and they intercept ET and ET is like, boom, you know, just like 60,000 yeah. miles an hour and all this. So they have a predetermined safe space that they're going to go to. This is some coordinate in space that these, that our super fast fighters are going to fly to. Mm -hmm. They fly to that space, you know, it's like 50 miles, five miles up and 50 miles over. Mm. And who's there? ET. Yes. Because it's all about consciousness. You can't you can't get around ET just by thinking that we have a plan. Meet behind the shed, you know. Well, ET somehow has some 
apparently some kind of telepathic link in this extent. Okay. Right. So that is not in Dolan's freaking calculation. And we have something else to talk about when we talk about Dolan that I'll get to in a minute. I love you know, this is exactly what they're proving, uh, these guys, when they do the calculations. They're proving that these aren't random aircraft being interrupted or discovered by us. Yeah, but to the point... Though, that, in fact, you just made a case for that. Yeah, but but your, your uh, interpretation of the data was that then... Yeah, we haven't gotten to that yet. Well, but you're, we'll, you, well, we got to it partially because you your partial interpretation... I managed to mention starts... Yeah, I didn't even start my rant. <laughs> well, <laughs> but, but, but I, you, I, I, you, you did, you did uh, kind of disparage the uh, spaceship from other planet yeah, hypothesis. But, uh, yeah, I, that was oh, my first argument against but, it. Right, but that doesn't... Now that argument has to go away, right? Because no. now CE5 is bringing in spacecraft from another planet. Yeah. And when I read Gria's they book, did the Nimitz thing. I read Gria's book um, about that back in the day when I was a meditation instructor. Of course, he had me. He had me uh, long before he said the word meditation. My point is that logically, there is no connection between rationally, logically, no connection between what you said in terms of you know, there's some kind of consciousness connection that's directing the spacecraft to there aren't really spacecraft. Yeah, there is. Those are two separate things now. No, is that both then? Well, then the, your data. I don't. I don't see how. I don't see how your data in that case contradicts the spacecraft from another planet. No, no, no. Because because in my view, we are talking about two. First of all, UFO or UAP is just a. You know, it's just that term. Don't ever say UAP. That's no, just I do. Mind control. But they're, they're, actually, it's a better term because they are. They are. Oh, no, un- it's mind control. No, no, it's they are unknown. They are area, oh. and they are phenomena. It is, they're not always objects. They're not it, always just, objects. Just so, but just so everybody knows, when they say UAP, mm-hmm. what they're saying is, we're going to divide and rule again. So we have this group of people out there who have some understanding, some grounding in UFO. They actually have some knowledge because, like you said, that we have this, you know, incredible open society where you can get a, and they know stuff about UFO. Now we're telling all those people, well, you don't know, really know anything because it's now all UAP. It doesn't matter. It's a, it's a name a by any other rose. It's the same people who invented UAP who invented UFO. It's the same fucking people. It's a military term. It's a game. I don't care. Exactly. I don't care. It's a It's a military you got to care. No. When I talked to Richard Dolan, and I interviewed Richard Dolan, and I got to circle back and get to, I hate the term circle back, but I'm <laughs> dying to talk to Richard Dolan again. Yeah. When I talked to him a couple of years ago, when the Nimitz thing first broke, yeah. and to me, it seemed obvious that this was a political psyop, that this whole disclosure, the whole Peter Lavenda, fake, 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 intelligence, intelligence, Tom DeLong. Fake, 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 <laughs> Lou Elizondo, fake, 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 that it was all just a, a, a game. And I went to to Dolan and I said, come on, this is a political psyop, right? I mean, this is a counterintelligence agent who's leading, who's coming out and saying, here is the truth. You know, we have Peter Lavenda saying, well, I got together with Tom DeLong. We decided the only way we could get to the truth is to go to the CIA. Aren't the alarm bells going off in your head? And Dolan goes, no. No, I really think it's, I think this is, you know, this is, this is legit. This guy's a legit whistleblower. And I was dumbfounded. I still don't know. So I don't know if he just made a mistake or what, but clearly at this point, we all know it was, we all know it was fake. We all know Lubel Alzander is a counterintelligence agent. No, it's the opposite. We, we all know that they achieved what they wanted. They wanted to get the UFO thing whitewashed in the open for whatever selfish reasons they had, because they're not, of course, Jesus. And they went with a method that worked. Now, was that hijacked or endorsed by some part of the power elite? Probably. It doesn't matter. They achieved what they wanted, which was to make it out in the open. Now, they achieved it. Too little credit has gone to the Tom DeLong folks for this. You, you, you attack them for the fact that New York Times, etc., has written about it. But at the same time, that's what everybody has been bitching about. Now my local newspaper writing about it. I can finally ask any guest I want the UFO question, and they won't recoil from it because everybody know now it's clean. Now that doesn't. It's not an either or here. It doesn't mean that these are Jesus heroes. But you know what? We're discussing something that. Why do we always end up discussing whether they are a psyop? I think it's 
incrementally less important and interesting than what I wanted to discuss, namely the nature of the UAPs. And I have a show now that's not out yet. It's called UAPs Explained. Okay. And that's a pretty bold uh, statement, yeah. but they are. I'm not saying it's the only explanation. I'm not saying uh, we say who they are or where they come from, but no. David Sarida definitely explains how they are working. And both him and me kind of agree based on the data. You, you, you've you probably seen the tether incident footage, etc. They look much more like entities than they do uh, crafts. Most of them, uh, they, they look like fish in an aquarium. And we discussed how they, they can be actually alive because we know that uh, already uh, down on earth when they, they now have come out and said, yeah, we are taking, uh, we, we are, we're measuring UV frequencies and we're seeing what can be defined as life forms there. This is rather new, but this fits with what me and him has been thinking all this time. Namely, that these are, and this explains why the military can have the audacity to shoot at them, to, they completely disagree. If the military really thought these were humanoids in spacecrafts from another place, they would freak out. It would be a completely different uh, discussion than what we're actually having. It's as if the military knows they pose no real threat. And that's why they're trying to be this tough guy against them. But they, of course, like you say, they have some aspects uh, in their nature that far surpasses our little ant kind of thing. So I'm saying that this phenomenon, which is a terminology, encompasses many different unknowns. One of them is also a mechanical, uh, technological aspect, because we know for sure there are crafts wherever they come from, whoever are operating them. And I think the huge majority of these crafts are from Earth. They are, and they may be actually, they may have studied, because Sereda, and I dare you to listen to the show, explains how it works. And they he, they may have studied these entities, whatever they are, and then converted it to technology, to mechanics. That may be one. But we also have the ancient connection. And when you say, oh, the ancient Africans knew, yes, but it's not like that they were apes and someone came and enlightened them. It's that they are a remnant of an ancient civilization that not only had his knowledge, but also mastered space travel. I, dare I, you I, to... I get you. I don't understand why the reverse engineering of alien craft gets how it how that gets you anywhere in terms of this discussion. Absolutely. We've re reverse engineered alien craft. You never, well, how does that... There's no bodies and there's no craft pointing to alien at this time. We, there are claims. You just said that, you just said we reverse engineered our technology yes. is based yes, on from entities or ancient tech. Yes, but but why not why not Bob Lazar in uh, Area Fifty One and where he worked on the craft? Why not uh, Stephen Greer who says he's interviewed? Completely real. Bob Lazar, when he says these are aliens, he even says it himself. I'm speculating, he says. I don't know. He what. says, I, he says, I've seen nine different craft. Uh, Richard, uh, yeah. Stephen Greer. But not bodies. But the point is, <laughs> it's such a loose argument that you're making. He says that he's that he has seen bodies and he has seen autopsy. But take that out for a second. Lazar says that? Yes. And he said his first I day. I haven't seen him say that. He said his first day on the job. He walked past a, a a room and there was a window and he saw the alien bodies and he later talked to people and they said, "Here's how many we have." And Stephen Greer, uh, you know, you just listened to that interview. He said he's interviewed multiple people who said that we have this many craft and this many bodies yeah. and some of them were alive. And I, and I followed his uh, press conference. As I know these people he he has um, helped bring forward. Now all of them aren't solid. Uh, of course, these info people are uh, there too. But yeah, basically, he did he did do a huge lifting for ufology. You had the disclosure project. You had the citizens disclosure thing that Dolan was involved with, and this other guy was I forgot his name, a ufologist. You had the secret space program conferences before the fake one that um, 
was done by Bill Cook and Corey Good and those. So that's three di- important goalposts in disclosure. And then the fourth is the Tom DeLong project that everybody still insists is some kind of psyop. But if it's a psyop, it's the worst psyop in the world because the only thing they've achieved since then is to annoy Pentagon because Pentagon now now is forced to try to spin the entire thing into it's the Russians and the Chinese because they, they can't put the uh, spirit back into the lamp and say there's no thing as a UFO. So that has been achieved. And if it was a PSYOP, I applaud it because it's fucking high time people take the phenomena seriously so we can start to discuss what's behind it, which we can do freely now, yeah. not just on this little inside baseball show we're doing today, but I can do it with any guest I have no matter why they're coming on, thanks to that effort. And honestly, my take on it uh, hasn't changed much. I still think that these insiders did it partially for selfish reasons, but also partially because they've always been you for nuts. Hal Puthoff, all these people have always been into this thing. And they wanted this out there and they managed it and they wanted to profit from it. I don't know if they managed that. But uh, and maybe they were also played uh, to some extent. Maybe maybe there was a faction among the elite that wanted it out, and they backed them. Maybe I don't know these things. But what I do know is, it's annoying the neocons to no end. You see, the it's not hard to see the deniers are still at it, and they're trying to put spin this into something that can serve them, because it doesn't serve them that everybody is now interested in it. So. You have yet to convince me of two things, Alex, and I am open to it. Number one, explain how this is a sinister psyop and not just what it seems to be, according to Occam's Razor. That's number one. And number two, where do you get this alien from? And with that, I mean uh, 3D humanoids on a different planet. I've never seen a link, even when I... And Dolan is an adherent to this. And I pushed him first time I had him on. And he had to admit that, well, okay, it's going by assumption because there's no evidence connecting it to. There's a lot of inference. His wife is a his wife is a first person witness to it. So yeah, but that doesn't mean it's an alien. People but, are but abducted. Yes, well, and that, it's not necessarily aliens. Okay, so so that for the the new skeptico, the private party skeptico. <laughs> okay, we can start right there, and I'll drop a name for you that you yep. can go. Everyone should go and read Jeremy McGowan. Mm-hmm. And his blog post on Lou Elizondo and the truth about everything. Jeremy, McGowan, I was almost going to make this show about the interviews I haven't done this year because Jeremy McGowan is the first person who's legitimately ghosted me. Uh-huh. He was so excited to be on the show. He is like, oh, it's an honor. I don't know why I thought it was an honor. But anyways, he's on the show. We're right there. We're ready to record. Doesn't show up just falls off the earth, doesn't respond. And the person who wow. connected with me with him starts communicating. He's like, well, yeah, you know, I'm kind of doing this, kind of do that. So, but everyone should still read his article. And the other one is on the election anyways. So, okay. So that's we suspicious. Have... He doesn't want to back up his, uh, his accusations. Hmm. Oh no, his accusations are rock solid. You go listen to him. He has all the proof has been laid Why out. Why is he afraid then? Well, yeah, People are people are people. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. Predictions? I guess. I guess. Predictions. And tell us what's going on with Alt Media United. Okay, okay. So okay, predictions. Damn. Let's start with you. Start with me. Yeah. Don't you have any predictions? Um, my predictions would be kind of the stuff that we talked about during the show in terms of I think things are much more uh, complicated at a global level than we think. And yeah. that I do think there's a light there's on a practical kind of uh, invest, uh, make money kind of thing. There's a light at the end of the tunnel in terms of the globalist agenda. It doesn't seem to be moving forward the way we thought in an inevitable way. And that will be revealed further and further in the next year. It's losing steam. They're not going to print $30 trillion in uh, in stupid green echo stuff. <laughs> and that is what they were playing for. And when they lose the ability to do that, and when the dollar does kind of get supremacy and the leash that's on China gets pulled tighter and tighter, tighter the choke chain. It's going to be back to business as usual, which some people are going to like and some people aren't. But from my rich ass perspective in Del Mar, California, that's just fine. Yeah. Hmm. Well, uh, I think it's easier to predict next year than the year after because um, 
There is an awakening going on, and that awakening may be hijacked when Trump takes over again, if he takes over, or, or the Republicans put it like that. It would be better if they had won both houses, because we would see a much bigger dishwashing of um, the COVID thing. But uh, don't underestimate the enormous awakening going on right now. Elon Musk, what he's doing, I, I think he will regret it, but he's opening the floodgate, basically, at Twitter. Now you can put, I, I sent you the video, did you see it? The one called Suddenly Death? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. These things are going to force open. It, it, it actually dovetails to what I said last year, and that's that when you feel it on your own body, that's when you can't have the luxury of, you know, entertaining a problem academically because now it's hard on reality. And this is a blessing in disguise. Now, just like the Omicron kind of took the power out of COVID, so eventually people are waking up to that. It's not that big a deal anymore. Uh, if it indeed ever was for most of us. For some, yeah, it sure is. But um uh, same vein, I think the vaccine reality, because that's such a hard, long before COVID, they've been pushing the vaccine thing that you couldn't question it. You were a completely deranged outcast if you question vaccines at all. Now, the reason many have covered up the problem with the vaccine is precisely because the low level people who are innocent, like a nurse or whatever, and they think, oh my God, there's so many people getting hurt, but I can't. I have to deny this. I can't support this coming out because then people will question all vaccines. And then, you know, I want the good thing and I believe the data I have is good. Therefore, I do a bad thing to cover up for what I believe will be a worse thing. And they don't understand that they are just then being useful tools, right? And this is for the first time is cracking. People are going to do that. They are going to question so much more, not just other vaccines, but everything to do with the pandemic. And then they're going to start questioning other things too, like the money level and everything. So I'm, I'm not saying that it will be a global awakening. I'm, I'm still back to where I said that. That, that. We have to go by coalitions. Many people will wake up to one thing, others to another, mm. but it's going to be a critical mass. Too many are going to be critical to the powers that be mm. because Never mind which field people are waking up to. You know where the crumbs always end up? It's the same fucking power elite. Or I should say the stooges of the real power elite, the the the, the symbols, the puppets of the real puppet masters. And when they fall, that's going to be so interesting. So, yeah, next year I think it's going to be one big step in that direction. And that will help uh, on the geopolitical level. It will create problems there too because... Um, what they really have per today is the media, is the information, is the spin, is the propaganda. That's where the West is strongest per today. And um, although there are back and forth, back and forth, they do so many. You know, for example, the, the Nord Stream, everybody know now it was the MU5 and CIA together. So when in real time people are waking up to these things so quickly, I don't, I don't see how they can keep it going anymore. It's like a, we're reaching a critical mass. Or a better term, they talk about this uh, event horizon thing. It seems to be very short in the distance on so many levels. And I'm just happy I'm around to see it because it can, you know, even if people wake up and they, let's say they overthrow the power elite, what could you replace? It could be worse. I'm not saying it's like hallelujah time. But um, like the Chinese said, we live in interesting times indeed. And I'm happy to, to be in for the ride. We have no <laughs> embrace changes. Yes, we have no alternative, do we? <laughs> well, I guess we could always, uh, you know, we could do an Epstein, you know. <laughs> but uh, no. You know, uh, uh, my one of my spiritual, uh, I don't know, guideposts, guy really like Neem Kurli Baba, you know, the Ram Das uh, oh. guru in India, you know, when the guys first went there and and met him and they were dropping acid and just wanted to do anything they could do to become enlightened. He said, oh, it's it's easy. See that rock there? Go tie it around your neck and throw it in the lake over there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and you'll, you'll get it, you know? Right. And it's like, this is your discussion, the last point about we all know debt. So once we put, that's an important boundary and that's what you're pointing out uh, last time in the crossing of that boundary. And then yeah. it draws the line that we are on the other side of that. So all the decisions we make are, yes, we live in 
interesting times or not interesting times. It doesn't matter. We just are here right now and trying to let the light shine through. But so many people can choose to metaphorically take that stone and throw themselves in the lake. Oh, well said. They can choose to remain in the forest, refusing to see anything, not understanding what, and those, you know what? The most dangerous people today are the lowest informed mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because because they are the engine, they, they are the gasoline in the engine that whoever are screwing with us on all these different levels are relying upon. So, so in, in uh, th this is why we don't have the luxury, Alex, of stopping, exploiting the rare opportunity we have to reach people. It's so rare if you look historically. Hundred years ago, you and me would have to go with these signs saying the end is nigh through the streets and ring the bell. That's the best we could do to reach people. So, people have the option to find us, and for me. I go by those who particularly take to my taste, which is not mainstream at all. And then we need someone like you who can cater to your approach. And then we're all cogs in in, in the big machine, in the good machine. <laughs> well, you continue to be an, an inspiration to Guy Point. I love talking to you. Ditto. And you give me a new tagline. I mean, skeptical, please unsubscribe. Please <laughs> unsubscribe. Please do not share or like. <laughs> it was the in inevitable uh, place you had to end up, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you can afford doing that too. You can afford that experiment. But yeah, uh, maybe you should go that route. I'm kind of going the opposite one. I'm kind of having multiple parties going on, hoping they will rub off on each other, hoping they will create some kind of resonance, some kind of uh, synergy effect. Uh, and you want to go deep, 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 deep into the core of it. And uh, I think both are warranted. So we going to be great that we keep in touch and, and you know, feel a finger on the pulse for, uh, every now and then. Absolutely. But we're not done with the alien discussion. I want to return to that in the future. Okay. All right. I haven't even made my case. <laughs> All right. Oh, yeah. Great. <laughs> okay. Thanks a lot for, for this session then. And see you at the end of this part of the travel. <laughs> awesome, Al. Terrific. Thank you so much. Okay, bro. Later. Take care. Thanks again to Al for joining me today on Skeptico. The one question I had to tee up from the show is, <laughs> what direction do you think Skeptico should go in the future? I have some definite ideas about how and when and if I should go forward. But I'd love to hear your thoughts too, so let me hear from you. And until next time, take care and bye for now.